Bob Beaton, otherwise known as Aquadoc. Welcome to Permastoked. How's it going, my friend? Hey, Derek. Uh, doing okay. Still here. Awesome. Great to have you here. Where am I talking to you from? I'm in the back of my waterbed store. I've got a, a really good internet connection here and a hardline telephone, a TV set, because normally I'd be out at my farm. I got a, a nice little 40 acre farm a few miles from here. And I don't have any of those luxuries out there. I got internet, but it's using my mobile device and tethering it to my computer. Oh, okay. Hotel, uh, telephone, mobile, but I don't know how to use a mobile phone for making calls or receiving calls. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no TV, unless oh, I get that Hulu or something. Wow, you're like uh, off the grid. Yeah, I'm like uh, pre pre 20th century. How are the waterbed sales these days? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a joke? <laughs> it's just not uh, something I hear about. I, I actually, well, I anymore. don't put in many store hours, okay? Uh, I come over here in the evening uh, to use the computer, the TV, the telephone. Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't have regular business hours anymore. I do get a few people that finally find a way to get through to me. Uh, and then I can fix them up for something they need, like a heater or mattress or something. Okay. But no, no walk-in customers. Nobody's been in the store for over a year, so besides wow. me. So are you sort of semi-retired or? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm. Uh, it happened a few years ago before the pandemic. Uh, it just really slowed down, and I wasn't putting in the store hours. I didn't need the money. Mm. Um, it just kind of it, it seemed kind of silly, and I had other things I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Uh, get. Good getting into my 70s now so uh i don't want to waste it sitting around waiting for people to come in and buy a waterbed heater or something yeah absolutely so i checked out the waterbed store on google maps i wanted to see sort of uh, where you are in relation to grand haven and so i i learned that it's really not too far but when i looked at that shop i couldn't help but wonder if there's been any board shaping over the years happening in there or any other kind of surfing shenanigans? There could be. I mean, it would be a nice little shop for that. Yeah. Uh, it was a bakery. Uh, that's a oh, come. Okay. It's got that gingerbread design to it. Oh, okay. uh, Hansel and Gretel kind of thing. That's Brock's Bakery uh, had one of their branch shops here. And it was a real estate office. It was a barber shop. It was a drugstore. It was a diner. It was a lot of different things. It's quite an old building. And uh, now it's a waterbed store, but not doing much waterbeds. Gotcha. Now, the name Aquadoc, what ah. came first? Aquadoc, <laughs> the, the store, or your nickname? I don't know. My nickname came first, and the store name came after my nickname. Nickname started out, uh, my dad was a doctor, a real good doctor. And uh, most doctor's sons get the nickname Doc. My older brother's nickname was Doc. And my, my nickname became Doc. I don't know why. Uh, it's kind of like we call Bob Pushaw the mayor because oh. his dad was the mayor. So we call him mayor. Oh, cool. It's just kind of a way the thing is six. And then uh, when I start going down to Mexico, the Mexicans started calling me Aqua, Aqua, Aqua Doc. And so that name kind of, at Aqua Tech, down the, front, the Mexicans tacked on the, aqua part and it became aqua doc and i liked uh, it sounded good and it sounded great for my business so i just stuck with it absolutely so aqua doc was that a, a pun with surfing how they got that yeah that's uh okay. basically yeah yeah because i went down there to surf and the mexicans we surfed with liked me a lot and they used to they call me aqua doc excellent all right doc well hey take me down memory lane I want to go back, I believe the year was 1967. Am I correct? Is that no. the year you first got on a board? No. No, okay. No, I go back to 1963. 63, okay. I was and then off. if you want to really get technical about it, I mean, me actually standing up on some sort of craft on a, and riding a wave into shore, you'd have to go back into the 1950. 54 55 and my dad uh we had these rubber rafts we used to i mean we always played the waves we had a 
a cottage right on Lake Michigan. We spent three months of the year there. Okay. Um, and uh, summer months. And uh, next door, I had the Wagemaker kids. I don't know if the name Wagemaker rings a bell with you, but the Wagemakers were famous for making boats. Okay. Uh, um, you know, recreational boats for regular people. You know what I uh, and, and Mr. Arrow Wagemaker invented the first aluminum sport fishing boat and he manufactured them. So we were always doing stuff in the water. I mean, because uh, he, Mr. Wagemaker, every weekend he'd bring home a new boat and he taught his kids how to drive the boats. And they were a little bit younger than me even. And, mm. oh, 10 or 11 years old, we were babysitter would drop us off out at Spring Lake Marina, Spring Lake Yacht Club. And, uh, <laughs> or not yacht club but the marina out there and we did put a boat in the water for us a boat we'd never even seen before the our wage maker dropped off and it was our job to test it all week go out and just run it up and down spring lake wow and uh, water yeah, water ever water skiing i was barefoot water skiing when i was 11 years old <laughs> i mean we've got to be really good water skiers because that's basically what we did all summer is run those boats around all the time yeah and um we oh we did other things too. We had a great big old woods behind us. It was a forest reserve behind our cottage, uh, and we used to go back there in the woods and just kind of live back there in tree houses and stuff. We did it's it's a magical three months of every year. That boy, once school is over, Grand Rapids. That's from Grand Rapids. Can you come out in a station wagon with all of us kids, my mom and my dad? And they didn't have the expressway back then. You had to come out Lakeshore Drive. I, you know, I know you're not familiar with that, but it's an old two lane highway okay and i could just remember boy once we got out to where it turned on to 31 north towards grand haven boy that magic feeling just hit you and you know man it's summer i'm just mm -hmm. gonna have fun yeah. all summer long and that's what we did we just had a blast we did everything with surfing scuba diving uh we even had like a diving bell uh we built a diving bell out of a I think it was a garbage can and a hose we put on it and we went down inside the diving bell and almost drowned. <laughs> <It was laughs> so we you were trying to breathe through an old Yeah, we're trying post? to breathe through it like a snorkel. We didn't really oh. to pump air down into it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, we try everything. I mean, we did all kinds of crazy stuff. We had sailboats, uh, little Alcourt sailfishes with uh, their closed hull sailboats. And they came before the catamaran, and they came way before the windsurfer. And we had two of those, and, well, we sailed the hell out of them things up and down the lake. And um, we surfed, we sail surfed waves. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a pirate thing where uh, if we saw somebody else with uh, maybe when a Hobie cats were coming in or whatever, somebody else had like a sunfish maybe or something, we had a, a tactic where we crisscrossed them. One of us would grab the boom and pull the thing over and then they'd flop over into the water and then the other guy would come up behind and kick their center board out and would, and then unhook their tiller uh rudder mm -hmm. and once we sailed away they were just stranded in the water just crying like oh my god my boat and their parts of their boat were like floating all around the place <laughs> and we had like sand bombs we had uh dixie cups full of sand that we'd Give broadsides, you know. We just, you know, we just had a blast doing that kind of stuff. It's just fooling around with kids that were younger than us and couldn't beat us up. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, just having fun, you know. And we did all kinds of stuff. Scuba diving. I, I had a scuba diving uh, business at one time, really? a salvage business. When I was really young, I was just basically had my driver's training. <laughs> basically had a driver's license. I put a sign up over at the yacht club if you lose anything underwater i could get it for you oh and, uh, so people would lose their glasses you know but on their boats or they'd lose their watch or something and i'd hop in my car and drive over there and i'll put on my tanks go down set up a oh i did a radio search i don't know if you know about that you take a, a rock and tie a rope on it set it down on the lake bottom and then you go all the way out to the end of the line and then you do a radio Pal, you know with your fins you kick around in a perfect circle keeping that line taut once you get around to your original marker you move in a couple feet and then you go around and do another radio thing in the meantime you're probing with your fingers into the sand because spring lake is a mucky lake okay and it's a beautiful lake but it's just the bottom is just all kind of mucky 
So you had to kind of probe with your fingers and pretty soon you'd hit something. Yeah. It's the guy's watchers, glasses. It generally is right around the area where his boat was, you know, anchored. I had one that was in the Grand Haven Channel where a guy was fishing and I found that too. I, I always succeeded in finding, I only had about four or five jobs, but I succeeded in every one of them. I found what I was looking for. I kind of wonder if I would have stuck with that, you know, and just kept getting into bigger and bigger salvage operations where I'd be today, you know, yeah. probably, you know, on the very Titanic. Inventive for, uh, very inventive for a young guy. So did you get much business? Doing yeah, that? I got about 20 bucks. I mean, that was a lot of money back in wow. 1960. Uh, 64, I think that's 634 mm -hmm. that I was doing that. And uh, you get 20 bucks. Well, I had one guy that wasn't going to pay me. I came up with his watch and he's on his little cabin cruiser with all of his relatives behind him. And he says, oh, you're only down there five minutes. I'm not going to pay you 20 bucks for five minutes work. And I says, well, maybe I just put the watch back down there and then uh, you can go find it yourself. He's, oh, no, no, I'll pay it. I'll pay it. You know? Yeah. And then he's got his whole family behind him and kind of saying, what a cheapskate, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I thought the same thing, uh, driving away. I drove up. I had a Corvette, a 63 Corvette split window. And um, that was my, one of my first cars I got. And uh, that's when I put my diving tanks fit perfect in that little cubby space behind the, the bucket seats. Mm. There's a little cubby space in there. My tanks would fit perfectly in there. And I'd drive up in that Corvette and the guy charging the guy 20 bucks an hour uh, for five minutes worth of work. And that's a company. I think it's just kind of. I see. <laughs> He's thinking this hot shot doesn't. And I was just like a young bucks. baby face kid. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just a young, young, young buck, you know. <laughs> you weren't using the garden hose for that. Uh, no, no, we had good you? equipment. No, <laughs> okay. my, my first dive and take was. Uh, that was a J valve. That's that's a tank without a reserve, as opposed to an R valve. And uh, it was a J valve. I'm sorry, it's a K valve. It's called a K valve. And um, that with that kind of a tank, once you know, once it started getting hard to breathe, mm -hmm. <laughs> you knew you were running out of air. Okay. And then once you ran out of air, you ran out of air. Where with a uh, J or an R valve, I can't remember the names of them now. Uh, you had a five minute reserve. You pull a little mm -hmm. wire thing on the side chain. Hopefully it didn't get pulled beforehand. So you, that's the one thing about a reserve and a tank is if it isn't there when you think it's supposed to be there. And okay. that's that could be more dangerous than a K valve. K valve's safer in that respect because you know you're gonna lose your air. You know you're gonna, where the mm -hmm. other one, you think you got a reserve and, uh, and and we did some wreck diving, you know, we'd be down inside the hull of a ship oh, and uh wow. And, you know, there wasn't an easy way out. We were under the yeah. ice. We went under the ice, too. Mm. And there's no easy way out. I mean, it took some time to follow your line all the way back to where you came in. So with a K-valve, once you've started, <gasps> you know, it wasn't getting a good full breath. Wow. Like, kind of like I am now. Uh, you had to, then you knew it was time to start following your line back out to your entrance. You always had a safety line uh, from where you got into the water or into a shipwreck or through a hole in the ice back up and you made sure it was staked in real well and tied real well. Smart. And you had that line, you could follow it back on out. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that could get tricky because the line would get tangled around and be different. Oh, wow. And, uh, but yeah, we had a great time doing that. And then finally, uh, oh, oh I, Dave and Ray, Ray Wagemaker. Now they were early surfers too. They were as early as I was, because we all did that together. Ray Wagemaker was probably the lead. And uh, Ray was kind of a guy, I always think of him as a movie star that never made a movie. Mm. I mean, he was just a real charismatic character. Oh, okay. And really out front on every, I think something was cool. He was the first one to do it. Gotcha. He was the first one, you know, and, and the surfing thing came along with the Beach Boys, actually before the Beach Boys, Dick Dale, The Ventures, other groups like that came along before the Beach Boys, and he had every one of those albums. And one day I go over to his house, he's got this, his hair is all of a sudden got this little blonde thing in the front, you know. He okay. started to use peroxide to make his hair blonde mm. because the Beach Boys, <laughs> bushy blonde hairdo, you know, uh, surfing yeah. USA. And uh, so, and all of a sudden he's wearing pendled in shirts and dirty white Levi's and Hirachi sandals. And pretty soon surfing was cool, but we didn't have mm -hmm. any surfboards. So he took one of our sailboats 
and uh, took the mast off of it and pushed it out in the water. And he was standing up right and waves on the sailboat hall. And we both started doing, all, all of us started doing that. Actually, it took three guys to get the thing out there and push wow. it out <laughs> the way. Yeah. It took a crew of people to, to surf on one so-called surfboard. But yeah, I got so I could do it by myself. And I was out there in October, first week in October. My mom, I was out there with my mom. We were closing up the cottage for the winter because it wasn't winterized. And I said, Mark, I, I'm going to go down surfing. She says, what? She says, yeah, I got my sailboat still down. On the, we just leave it right on the beach mm -hmm. back then. And uh, nobody would bother it. So I flipped it over and pulled it out in the water. And I uh, went out to the second sandbar, gave it a push. And uh, what you do is take the center board out and use it as a paddle to get going a little bit faster. Once you felt you got the wave, you slip the center board back down into the, into the hull so it would track, you know. Okay. And, and I left the tiller on and the rudder. So when I stood up, my back foot uh, was stepping right on the tiller so I could turn the boat with my foot. <laughs> Normally you use your hand and your arm with the yeah. tiller. To, but I was using my back foot and I could steer that thing and turn sideways and be riding the wave and the, at the center board down so it would track. And I could ride it all the way practically into shore. And I was doing that one day and a guy comes walking up the beach with a camera and he starts taking pictures. And lo and behold, the next day I'm in the front page of the Grand Haven Tribune. Really? Surf, surfing on my sailboat hall. October, <laughs> October 6, 1963, Grand Haven Tribune, front page. And uh, it says, doesn't say Bob Beaton or Doc or Aquatox, it says Bruce Beaton. Bruce? And yeah, because my family calls me Bruce because my sister got in the habit of calling everybody in our family by their middle names. Oh, okay. My name is Robert Bruce Beaton. So mm. it says Bruce Beaton in the picture, but that's, that's me. <laughs> is that in the, uh, any of those that, uh, archives? That's in that, one of those articles, yeah. That's yeah. In the, yeah, it's in the article section of that uh, web page, which you might want to post on your site because um, it's pretty interesting. I don't know if you know, a lot of younger surfers have ever seen that. In fact, I bet a lot of them weren't even born when we had our surfing exhibit at the at Grand Haven uh, Museum, which was one of the best they've ever had. It, it, it was only booked for like two weeks and it was in there for three or four months. So I took the Dark Day Reunion pictures. And if you look at the one picture of Matt's there with the dog on the pier. He's got a surfboard. And then there's that guy with the one-legged, the owner of the dog, yes. standing in the back of it. <laughs> well, I had him stand there because I wanted him to stand right where his dog got washed off the pier. Oh, really? So that's a reference point for his dog getting washed off. I'm a real analytical person as far as um, uh, pier drownings, incidences, injuries, rip currents, any of that kind of stuff. I've got all the data, how those people drown. Uh, what became of it, well, safety devices and safety programs. I do all the history on all that stuff. I'm a historian anyway, so I, um, it's just one of my specialties. And um, so I got real analytical about anytime I get a chance to talk to an eyewitness or participant mm -hmm. in a rescue, whether it be the victim or the rescuer, yeah. I always get all the detailed information I can. And I, I uh, hopefully you're going to publish that someday. I tried to. I, it's on the site. Uh, there is stuff on beach and pier safety. It shows where all the people drowned off the Grand Haven Pier uh, at that time. Some like twenty of them, twenty people, twenty people over uh, nineteen twenty-five up to uh, around two thousand or so. I think there's been one or two since that. I don't keep as good a track on that as I used to. I mean, up through the nineties, that was when I was working with the United States Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Coast Guard, City of Grand Haven, City of Muskegon, City of Ludington, uh, Marquette, uh, over on West, well, all, all around the lakes. I was going around. I was like a Great Lakes uh, Beach and Pure Safety uh, advocate, but as mostly pure safety when I did that, when I traveled about. the As far as the rip currents go, I never really got a handle on that until Oh, 10, 12, maybe 15 years ago, I finally figured out that that was a that was a big deal, too. And I made the same mistake as a lot of people are making that try to do some good, mm. but they're given the wrong information on the rip currents. It just it just is. It's, it's not correct. And um, the rip currents 
there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. People mm -hmm. don't realize it. Uh, rip currents have happened. Some of the worst ones happen on perfectly calm days. There's no waves at all. Actually, really? rip currents don't have much to do with waves at all. Structural rip currents do, but they're not very strong. Um, the Grand Haven Piers got one. All the Piers pretty much got them, mm -hmm. but they're not really strong. They're not killers. I've okay. only been in one that was myself, what you call a killer rip current, a real beach rip current. And it actually was an obstructional one, but of a different type. Um, it was so strong that I was standing in knee deep water, walking in from the rock pile. Okay. Uh, and I, I probably walked in from the rock pile from where you stop on your wave and you walk in, you go up the pier again. I probably have done that over a thousand times mm -hmm. in all kinds of conditions. And this was just a oh, five foot day. It was nothing super big or anything. And I just happened to be walking in and then there's three little kids all huddled together in the water. And I thought, what are they doing? I was playing a game or a football. So it's like a football huddle, but they were shaking. I looked at them. I thought they're shaking. What are they afraid of? And I walked a little bit closer to them and I felt it. And it was a really strong current. I mean, I'm not, I shouldn't even call it a current. It's more like a stream of water. Like if you went into a river, a fast flowing river. Okay. And it just, it was that stronger, stronger. And I was actually scared. And I had a tethered surfboard under my arm and I was only in knee deep water. And it wow. scared me. And I've been all through, I've been through all kinds of stuff out on the lake and in the ocean. That scared me. And I was just a neat, I thought, why did that scare me in knee deep water? I had a tethered surfboard under my arm, but it was so strong. And that was the only time I ever felt that of the thousands of times I walked ashore there. But it was a, it was a structural rip current, sort of, but not in the same way as what we had normally there, that mm -hmm. just the water sweeping up the shore hits the pier, then starts going off the pier and it'll carry you along if you're next up here. No, this is where you had an influx of water into the area where the water was hitting the pier, but pushing in towards shore. The other water was coming along the shore and pushing towards the pier. Where they both met, it pushed out diagonally uh, okay. from the pier. And that was what got us. And I, I, mm. I thought, wow. And then I can remember all my research. I did a lot of study of aerial photographs and such, because at one time I believed that you could find out where the rip currents are if you could see the breaks in the sandbar, which you can in an aerial photograph. You okay. can see the dark spots in the sandbar where the water comes out. I thought, aha, this is it. And uh, and I actually went out on the ice during the winter time. <laughs> I don't know what I was doing, but I was trying to figure out where the sand was going to pile up, where the uh, where the sandbars were going to be, and stuff like that. I don't know what I was doing, but anyway. That's that's the, I, I seen in one picture where there was a dark line right on this diagonal path that I was just describing. It was a dark line in the water. I thought it was something on the photograph. I thought, no, that's just a dark straight line, like somebody drew a line on that. But it wasn't. It was it was that was carved out by a kind of rip current as I just described to you. Mm -hmm. And that's how come people drown in those things, and it'd be perfect. People swimming there before, nobody getting pulled out. People be swimming there afterwards, nobody pulled out. But for about 20 minutes, those things become active. And they're only about 10 feet wide, 10, 12 feet wide. And if you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time, you get sucked right out really fast. Faster than any ocean rip, uh, rip current I've been in. Faster than anything. It's a fluctuation of water. And it comes in because water is displaced someplace else in the lake. What you get is a, uh, a high pressure center coming down of wind hitting the lake surface. Uh, we call a wind shear, mm -hmm. displacing vast volumes of water in a limited area. And that is like the fat lady jumping in on one end of the swimming pool and then the waves coming all the way down to the other end. <laughs> and that's what happens it, down in Southern Lake, Michigan. Uh, you'll get that out front of Chicago, wherever, and it'll dig into the water surface and push that water all the way back up to Grand Haven, Muskegon, mm. where have you, and uh, displace the water. And then when that happens, that's where you get these killer rips. And that's how come they're only on certain days 
at certain times. If what they say is true about longshore currents uh, going up the beach and then going out into the lake, like you see in a lot of the graphics that they yeah. use, mm -hmm. uh, it's just not happening. The physics just are not there and the case studies are not there. Those would be there all the time. And I tested that. I thought well, that's how I thought it was too, because I saw when I Googled up rip currents, I came up with all these images of these water sweeping out into the ocean between these like coral reefs or whatever it was. And I thought, well, that's like our sandbars, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how that happened. It's not at all how it happens. Uh, okay. I walked those sandbars. I walked those sandbars. I don't know how many times on the Southwest days when the only time we had rip currents and there was a little tiny bit. I think I almost wanted it to happen so much. I kind of imagined I was just getting pushed yeah. out. I don't even think I was really, but I thought, oh, yeah, that's it. I, you know, you try to convince yourself of the theory that you think is plausible. And if you do that, it's really dangerous because it's not scientific at all. It's, stu it's stupidity actually. And uh, to think that uh, rip currents are caused by wave action and they're not. Mm -hmm. And all the flag systems, the red and the green and the yellow flags, they're all put up based on wave conditions as far as rip currents go. And we've had two green flag rip current drownings at Grand Haven, which is stays that's perfectly safe to go out. There's hardly any waves or anything. And we've had one yellow one. Mm -hmm. And we've had plenty of red flag days when nobody drowned. You know what I mean? So, really? These things happen. They're extraordinary events. They're like, uh, oh, almost as extraordinary as what you see in April around this time of year on Lake Michigan. You see, a, uh, oh, I forgot what they call them now, where, where you see Milwaukee on the other. Milwaukee is 80, 80 some miles away from okay. Grand Haven. Yeah. And a human eye can only see 15 to 20 miles. Mm. But you're seeing the car lights on cars in Milwaukee. You're seeing buildings with lights on, airport lights, all this stuff, the whole side of the lakeshore lights up like the lake's only 10 or 12 feet, 12 miles wide. Oh, wow. You're thinking, wow. <laughs> and that, and uh, that's, oh, what do they call it? My mind's all on surfing right now, so I can't think of that name. Well, that's so okay. That, it's a good place to be. But that's that's how odd these rip currents are. That's yeah. how people, if they were happening the way people, basic safety organizations are presenting them as happening, there would be hundreds and hundreds of drownings, recurrent drownings every summer, okay. just, just in the, our side of the lake alone. Because, mm. hey, the lake is boring unless there's waves. If there's waves on there, oh, yeah. they want to go out and they want to play in them waves. They want to body surf. They want to go do stuff and, and have fun. And mm -hmm. They're not going to drown. I mean, they're not. And, yeah. and and if they were, they would have drowned. They didn't. I mean, yeah, we've had some rip current drownings. They have one every couple of years or so, two, mm -hmm. three years, maybe. But now there are very unique situations that happen. And like I said, we've had days where four people drowned in uh, 2003, I think it was, just um, south of Grand Haven. Four people drowned within about 20 minutes from a rip current. Well, it's when the conditions perfect. are rough, people are sort of well more aware, I suppose. Whereas, they think, yeah, they're seeing power. They're seeing the lake yeah. getting angry, and they're seeing energy. And you go out, and they get knocked down, and mm -hmm. all this stuff's happening. It's, yeah, this is when the rip currents happen. they got to be careful. And no, it's not when the rip currents happen. There might be a little bit stronger structural rip current next to the pier, but it's nothing that's going to drown you. Yeah, it's going to carry along the pier a little bit. Pretty soon, you could grab a ladder, try to climb out of it or something. But you're not going to get sucked out. Not the way, not the kind of power I'm talking about. That one day that I got, you know, knee deep water, and I thought I was going to drown. Yeah, you know, and uh, but no, not like that kind of power. No, uh, sometimes you can see the brown sand in the mm. water, and it can kind of see and getting sucked out. And yeah, that is so to speak a rip current. But it's not the kind of rip current that kills people. No, oh, okay. It, it's just not there. The power is not there. The physics aren't there. The yeah. volume of water you need and the definition of the basin itself that's going to hold that water and eventually let it spill out. The physics just are not there. Most waves have, have shoaled out before they even get to shore. And oh, you look okay. at the waves, even on a big day, the amount of water that actually washes up on the shoreline very minimal compared mm -hmm. to maybe 10, 15 foot waves out in the lake. But time yeah. to get into the shore, they're just, they're all shoaled off. There's no power. There's no water volume there. 
It just gotcha. it just doesn't it just doesn't work. And yeah. uh, mark my words, someday um, they're going to have a buoy system set up out there, and they're going to be able to trace that big what I call depression that movement of water, a mound of water that actually moves up Lake Michigan from that uh, weather condition, Southern Lake Michigan, they're going to have buoys are going to pick that up and they're going to have it on the beach on your cell phone. They say, okay, there is a rip current alert. It will be at area three in about 20 minutes. And there's about three areas at Grand Haven, depending on the direction these things come, that it'll hit. And, um, and, and say, you're going to get kids to say, hey, mom, the rip current's coming. Can we go ride it? And, and she says, yeah, but make sure you tether your raft, uh, yeah. your rotation device. And yeah, you can go ride it. And the kids will all be there for the rip current. And they get on their little rafts with their tethers and they'll ride the thing. Okay, yeah, it's fun, you know. <laughs> and that's that's what it's going to be. But we'll know uh, what it is, where it is, when it's going to happen. You're not going to have a situation where you got a swimmer out there, you know, just having fun. And they're getting sucked away because they don't know they were in a rip current. Wow. They're gonna, once you know where it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, it's very easy physics. It's not like yeah. you're trying to think of some antivirus for some pandemic. It's mm -hmm. not that scientific. It's basically <laughs> just a bunch of water that's that displaced <laughs> and it's moving and it's going to hit someplace. And we just got to figure out where that is, how fast it's moving, what direction, and where and when it's going to hit. You yeah. got it. And I think, uh, of I, all I think the it, research you've done to figure this out, and before you know it, there's just going to be an app telling you everything. Well, it's gonna. That's what I say. You <laughs> yeah. can do it. You can do it right now, Derek. If 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 I was thinking of going over to Grand Haven High School, they got a pretty good science team over there. And say, hey, build oh, okay. me an app that people can put on their little smartphones, go to the beach, and it's going to bring up the weather radar. It's going to show these very ugly looking purple, purple, reddish, <laughs> orange blotches down in Southern Lake Michigan, which are what call, I I actually happened to me. Um, Many a days, I, I like I was watching your uh, Matt Molesky video last night, uh, yes. and he talks about the weather boys and watching those colors. Mm. If you see those colors, and and I was sitting there one day, I think, wow, I think the waves might come up today, and I just sitting there watching those weather boys on the computer. I think I might go down there about an hour or two, and then I kept looking. And I thought, wow, there's there's a, a orange, you know, and you watch this. Like, uh, radar and you see these things coming on to Lake Michigan from southern Indiana or up to Indiana and onto Lake Michigan. And I thought, wow, that's going to cause a rip current. It was a really ugly looking mm -hmm. uh, orange blotch. You know? <laughs> you know, it was like, <laughs> this is bad looking stuff. And uh, there's going to be a rip current at Grand Haven. I just think it's going to be. And I got all my gear, got my wetsuit, I got my surfing glasses, got all my wax and board, all stuff up in a neat little pile ready to leave. And I kept watching the waves weren't very big. And I, I oh, no, I guess I'm not going to go. Okay. I'm watching the news about an hour later. Or not, and I'm, it came on, but it happened actually earlier. About the time that I would have been down there, a kid, uh, dad drowned trying to save his kid, got oh, caught in a rip current. And uh, he went to get to the kid, and the kid survived it, but he drowned in that river. Oh, brother. I thought to myself, oh, my God, I was going to be down there. And I knew it was going to be in that spot. Just like you say, yeah. two spots down there. And I knew what spot it was from the direction I could see that. Well, they give you a 15-second replay wow. of the, the movement of the thing. And I could see what direction it was going. I thought, that's going to hit at area number two, I bet. And I knew right, Derek, I knew right where it was going to hit. I knew when it was going to hit. I had my board, my wetsuit, all that stuff ready. I could go down there and just stood on that beach and mm -hmm. see those kid, that kid in the water and dad, oh, I might have hit the water, got him in, got on the board, and the kid, guy would be alive right now. So what I'm saying is predictable. And you can make an app if you can get that radar thing on your app. Actually, you've already got it. If mm -hmm. you just know what to look for on your app, on your, uh, on your uh, smartphone, you know what to look at. Yeah. You can see those things developing and you can predict them. You have to have an eye for it and the knowledge for it, but you know, what's that? It's just telling people just yeah. instructions. You know, this is how you spot a rip current. And uh, that's probably all there is to it. Really, for yeah. our lake, I mean, for the way we're we're doing things here, it's just a matter of detecting the things with your with the technology we got, which we have. And it's not just something scientists have got. It's you and I and everybody's got these things. Yeah. Uh, smartphones with you know, with the yeah. radar on them. And um, 
you know, you could. Yeah, rip curls kind of have this mystique around them, but what you're saying is they're really uh, scientific. They can be explained, you know, right down to the atom, I suppose. Right, and you're dealing with a pretty big, strong field of energy, so it's not like some minuscule thing you have to see under a microscope. Mm -hmm. It's something that's it's a pretty big thing. Yeah. And uh, it's visible on the lake surface too. Uh, very small, straight looking, very closely spaced waves together. Very, really funny looking. And I've got reports that go back over a hundred years on these things. Um, and they say, that's the way it is. It says there's waves, but they don't look like regular waves. They're, they're very straight and they're very close together. That's actually water, volumes of water moving. That's not waves moving through water. That's okay. water moving. And that's what we're dealing with. When you start dealing with moving water, it doesn't take much moving water to knock a person off their feet, like six inches of moving water, moving oh. fast enough, will take somebody right off their feet, which, which is shown on pier wash offs and things like that. Um, yeah. And I've had the same, I've been washed off that pier three or four times. And um, <laughs> I just, yeah, it just, uh, you underestimate the power of water. Sure. The water itself is strong. Yeah. So I imagine you've had your own share of scares over the years. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So Bob, you took we we were talking about the surfboard. Now Vince Durer asked me to ask you about your first surfboard. So I'm guessing that we just covered that. That was the well. That was the first thing I surfed with. Okay, uh -uh. so take me through that a little bit. So you made it into the paper, surfing in on that boat. Yep, 63. That was October, okay. and that pretty much sealed up that season. Because All then right. uh, got into November, December, winter, you know. And the next year was 64. Well, that was the end of the um, sailboat surfing. All of a sudden, we had this yellow banana we called it and it was a yellow pop-out board ray wage maker got it of course and when he got tired of it then dave got to use it and then when dave got tired of it i got to use it so that was a bummer because mm. wage would be out surfing because there's other people starting to pop up the great lake surfing association started in 64 oh, okay and uh the regardless what other so-called <laughs> great lakes historians will tell you um, it is the oldest uh, Great Lakes, uh, it's the oldest lake, Great Lakes uh, Surfing Association. <laughs> so I remember. I get arguments I, from one person I know, but uh, it is. I, I was with those guys. That got, I got the newsletters that came out in 64 for the okay. organization. I got the documentation and they, they were the same guys all the way up to 1969. Mm -hmm. And when that original crew of Rick Sapinski, R.C. Allen, that whole crew, Terry Lau, that finished it. Actually, I helped seal the deal on that. <laughs> Even though I am the director of the Great Lakes Surfing Association now, I helped seal the deal on that, not intentionally, but uh, Dave Wagemaker and I came back from Mexico. We had revolutionary boards and they were, get this, these were short boards and everybody was riding nine foot, nine and a half foot, 10 foot, 10 and a half foot surfboards. That's what surfboards were back in 1967. That's what people rode. That's what we rode. And all of a sudden, Dave Wagemaker and I show up with boards that we got in California. And they were eight foot four and they were seven foot ten. Now, surfboards, Hawaii, and a Rick. I had the Rick, which is a what the shittiest board I've ever had. But it was, <laughs> it, it was a there were short boards. So we laid them down on the beach, right? Where they had the signups for the contest and all the judges were there. These were real formal surfing contests. If we had any surfing contests, yeah, we had the original surf. The guys from Sheboygan came over to our side of the lake for the contest because we were the Great Lakes Surfing Association. Grand Haven was the center of the universe as far as surfing on the Great Lakes was concerned. Mm -hmm. And we had the contest and there were very formal contests with trophies and a uh, number of judges and very well run and organized. Not, not like some of the later ones were, but our first... Uh, the first GLSA contests were a really great contests. Anyway, we laid those boards down and Rick and RC and those guys, they, they thought they were, they were the kings of the surf. They were the coons. So were Dave and I. And, uh, and uh, cause we lived on the beach and we started surfing just as soon as they did it, if not before. And they looked at our boards as, you can't surf on those. 
I mean, they said that to like people were saying you can't surf on Lake Michigan. They says you can't surf on boards that short on wow. the lakes. They won't float you enough to catch yeah. a wave. And Dave says, okay. He just smiled. He had a really charismatic smile. He just got, okay. He just smiled and blow in his eye. And I was kind of just following his lead. It says, okay. And uh, they held that contest. And um, I, uh, the one picture you saw me riding that, you, did you see that one picture I sent you? Know, me riding a real straight looking wave and I was in a crouch, crouch yes. down. That, that was taken during the contest. I got fourth in that contest. Oh, okay. And uh, that picture was a Sports Illustrated pitch, Sports Picture of the Year award. Really? Rick Salt took that picture. And uh, Dave, okay, it came down to the last heat. Dave was in the last heat. It came down to Rick was out in the water. Craig Van Single, all the great surfers at that time were in the water, in the finals, and Dave Wagemaker. All of a sudden, Dave cuts away from the pack, paddles up the beach by about a couple hundred feet. And you know, what the hell is he doing? The waves are all breaking over here. And Dave paddles over to this other spot. And uh, the contest is winding down. I mean, it's going to, whoever gets the last good wave is going to win this thing. Mm -hmm. And there was like 15, 10. And they're counting down the seconds and Dave took off on this really nice little three and a half, four foot wave. Water was really clear. It was the Northwest and the water was clear. And underneath the wave was the ruins of the old Bossaker Pier. I think that's wow. maybe why nobody was surfing there because that pier, okay. the timbers of it and stuff were sticking up almost out of the water. And Dave mm -hmm. took off right in front of all that crap. And he just did, and Dave had a really nice, posture on the surfboard he looked like robert august in fact i think he thought he was robert august yeah. <laughs> from endless summer and he took a nice night made a beautiful little drop and a nice turn and very picturesque pose you know for the 60s and he just and everybody just their jaws just dropped on the beach and, oh my god and they could see the stuff the temper sticking up underneath the water underneath of where he was riding and stuff and they were just like holding their breasts and he rode that into shore and everybody, once he, you know, popped off his board, everybody cheered. <laughs> he, won the, he won the freaking contest with a board that they didn't think would even float yet in Lake Michigan. And he won the contest. That surfboard's why is a step deck. Wow. So <laughs> this was Dave Wagemaker. Won Dave Wagemaker, contest. Yeah. So your buddy, the guy you and him started together, he won the first Great Lakes Surfing Association contest. He won the last one because what oh, okay. happened was that contest was set up. They seeded that contest so Rick and RC and all of their buddies could get the first five trophies. There were supposed to be five trophies given out. And they had it seeded so those five would end up in that last heat and they would all get a trophy and they'd get their picture sent into Surfer Magazine. Oh, okay. Well, we messed that up because Dave got first, I got fourth. And uh, when they came to give out the trophies, no, they didn't give out five. They said, no, we're only going to give out three. They were pretty pissed off. RC was oh, the guy handing out the trophies. And he said, no, we're not giving them out for five. We've just given out for three. We're going to save these other trophies for another contest. Well, there wasn't one. They were so upset about it. That was the end of the show. I say, with those people. Oh. And so they just let it go. And they all went their own ways. Rick went out to California and they all moved away and they never had that group never had the jealous anymore. That that contest was set for them to walk into immortality, and uh, you know it just didn't happen. So Dave how many should... years did those contests run then? Bob? Oh, they ran from 1960. I like to say there was one in '64, but I think not. I think '66, '67, '68. There's three big contests. Oh, okay. And, uh, and then they disbanded the uh, GLS. Then they just didn't have disbanded. They just didn't have the contests anymore. They didn't have the meetings. You never saw them up at Terry Lau's anymore. Um, they just weren't on the beach anymore, and they just all kind of filtered away and went their own ways. And that was, they never went to the short board. They, oh, they okay. the last boards they rode were the ten foot boards, and that's what everybody rode back then. Back in in the sixties, it was much different than the seventies or eighties as far as surfing goes. It was a totally that was a different thing. Um, I would say, it. well, the boards were big. They were 10 foot. I had a Hobie nose rider, a 10 foot Hobie nose rider. And um, they were, they were big boards. And 
so it wasn't a problem of catching a wave or riding a wave. It's what you did on the board. Mm. The board was just a platform where you did your dance. Now, you could either walk your way up to the nose. You could do a spinner. You could do a coffin. You could do a Cosimoto. You could do all these kind of neat little tricks. You could have really cool poses. Uh, all these kind of things. It was what you did on your surfboard. Then when the boards got smaller, it was what you did with your surfboard and what the board, how you made the board carve into the wave and how, it, you know, you get set up in the tube and all that. Although getting set up in the tube was always there because even with the long boards, it was getting in the pocket, standing in the pocket with that really nice Phil Edwards pose, you know, it's just that really masterful look that you had mm -hmm. and uh, you had complete control of nature. <laughs> I mean, you were like a god, you know what I mean? And uh, that's what that was. But then uh, once the boards got shorter, it was more what you were doing with your board. Uh, after the 10-foot thing, then came the seven-foot boards and uh, Jerry Lopez and the uh, lightning bolts. Yeah. And um, that kind of surfing came in. You could go on YouTube and you could pretty much trace the whole thing of surfing if you just look at the yeah, right for sure. dates of them. And then, then came after that came the bonzers and the quad fins. And I had a, I had a board that was five foot ten at one time, a twin fin, five ten twin fin. And uh, I can't believe the ways I rolled on that thing. Yeah. I just can't. I did. I can't. I don't think I could even. I don't know what I would do on that thing today? I don't have it anymore. What's your board of choice these days, Bob? Oh, I ride a nine foot. Um, oh, okay. Just a, a real nice board. It was shaped by the lake uh, for the lakes. Um, but I haven't been surfing in about <sighs> things happen. I, you get older and medical things. Oh, okay. that, that's what happened to me is the medical things. And mostly it started with the skin cancer thing. Uh, uh, too much sunshine. I spent my times on the beaches. We lived on Lake Michigan. I spent so much time on the beaches baking in the sun and stuff like that. It finally caught up to me. Oh, I'm more oh. of a light complected guy. Uh, uh, scotch irish descent you know so it's lighter yeah. skin and i had this great big i had a little spot on the end of my nose <laughs> i went to the dentist and the dentist says you got a spot on the end of your nose it says hey good luck good observation and he says i can get to sign you up for an appointment not a dentist appointment but with a um, dermatologist mm. so, uh, i went and that was cancer and uh oh, they had to do more surgery on it and that took 46 stitches um you take your skin and what they do is they why 46 stitches because they cut all the way from the bridge of your nose between your eyelashes all the way down to the end of your nose that's how long the cut is oh they wow. take all that skin and pull it over and then stitch it all back together again oh, even Ooh. though it's just a little spot on the end of your nose yeah so really. that scared the hell out of me i thought I well guess. god uh it didn't leave much of a scar it's kind of cool now <laughs> um I thought Surfing I didn't want this to happen again. And I had some other issues with my face getting the um, pre-cancer pre stuff. And I got mm -hmm. treated and I was okay. I thought, man, I don't want to go through too much of that. I'm going to look like the Frankenstein monster in another 10 years. Yeah, I, really? I just, I just, so I started wearing this hat out surfing. Well, that doesn't help much because you're getting the glare off the water. And that's actually mm -hmm. worse than the direct sunlight almost. And uh, so that kind of put the damper on things. I hurt my shoulder one time, pulled that out and missed a whole season for that. The back started hurt. A bunch of stuff happened medically that um, it made it harder for, me, harder for me to get out there and, and surf. And um, I can't blame it all on medical stuff. There was a point in my life where I, I thought when I started surfing, I dedicated my whole life to it. I, I skipped marriage. I skipped a career. I skipped everything just so I could always go surfing if I wanted to. Okay. And uh, it got towards the end of my life, towards the end of my life, into my 60s when I was on, or actually 50s, when all of a sudden there's, oh, the waves are coming up, but God, I want to go up to the racetrack because we had a harness racing track that started up in Muskegon. And I okay. love betting those horses and figuring those race programs and figuring out who's going to win and going up there and betting them and winning. And uh, I'd studied for three or four days. This one day, I remember in the fall, I studied my racing program for about three days. I had, oh, I looked like Einstein and steroids for my <laughs> race program. And 
I go home, I'm driving over the overpass. Now at that point, there's a point where you can turn north, go up to the racetrack, or I could go and turn south and go down to Grand Haven and go on surfing. Because I thought the waves might be up, but I know the racetrack's up there. And I got to that overpass, I thought, which way am I going to go? And it's like a crossroads in my life. And I, you know what, for all the importance it was, I can't remember what decision I made. But right then <laughs> and there, I knew, wow. There's something I actually like to do as much as I like to go surfing. I can't say more, but I can say as much. Yeah. And I thought, wow, I never figured on that happening. But I used to be nuts about skiing, snow skiing when I was much younger. And um, I thought, boy, I always want to ski the rest of my life. I want to ski. I want to ski. I want to go down mountains and you know, do all this stuff. And that, you know, surfing came along and I never even went skiing. I went down to Mexico every winter. I didn't go skiing. Yeah. You know, I gave up skiing. Skeets just became some old things down in the basement, you know, and that was, that was that, you know. And so I don't know. It's just another thing that happened, too, is I found out that, you know, I, I hate to say it. It's almost blasphemy, but you don't really have to surf to go surfing. Oh, I should say that that way. Well, I, there's other ways of surfing besides going out in the water and surfing. Because what I found, I found second life, and for me, that was a way that I could live a different life, an extra life. Because my regular life is getting towards the end. In fact, it's getting real towards the end now. And I thought it was back in my 60s. So mm -hmm. I started going into second life, and I started living a whole new life. I built Grand Haven in the year 2034. I got an old avatar, old man avatar. Uh, I found all the good surf spots in Second Life. I went and surfed them. I joined the um, Second Life Surfing Association. I was in all their contests. I finally made it to their Hall of Fame. Um, I had a whole surfing community around me, beautiful, perfect waves. And you pick out your own surfboard. My surfboard had my name on Aqueduct. I had it made a custom made uh, LSD surfboard. And um, I just led a whole surfing life in Second Life. I was a sponsor for it, I was surfing in it. Uh, I loved it, and I still do. So I what is this, Bob? Second Life. I'm not familiar with that. Oh, yeah, go to secondlife.com. Okay, <laughs> and, I'm, I'm seeing your avatar, though. I was wondering yeah. what that was. Yeah, and, uh, well, you could. I got a little movie, too, I made, a serpent movie with me in it. Um, I'll give you that link. Okay. Yeah, and um, what it is, it's uh, you go to secondlife.com, and... They're telling you, you can go live a second life. You can create a new person. And this isn't a game. This is a way of living. Um, there's wow. money in it. I make up uh, my businesses in second life. Now I've got a, um, a horse breeding business. And I got a cat breeding business in second life. And it pays me 700 to a thousand dollars a week. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. So it's a form of income for me. Um, wow. If you're, uh, if you're like yourself, you want to get into the entertainment business, um, you can open up your own venue in Second Life and go play in clubs that's real people in them, and they'll give you donations, or the club management will pay you to perform. Uh, if, like wow, if you just say, "Wow, I want to, I want to write music and I want to play guitar and sing." Okay, well, where can I get a venue in real life? Oh, no, nobody will hire you. Okay, <laughs> well, how about Second Life? Yeah, they'll pay you. They're not going to pay you a lot, but they'll pay you something, and you're going to have people listening to you and liking you and clapping and. And um, uh, fascinating. And, and so all of a sudden you find out, wow, I don't have to live in real life anymore. I can live in second life. And that's what happened to me. Now, what well, a bad thing about it is my first life took a dump because my second life took a jump. I mean, okay. I, I really, I became a championship jockey. I raised horses and then I finally owned a horse company and I owned a cat breeding company where, um, Anyway, I'm leading a whole life, a great life, and they all know me as a Great Lake surfing legend in Second Life. The surfers, all a lot of them even heard of me. They saw wow. me in the movie Step in the Liquid, and they said, you're that guy? And I said, yeah. Wow, we got a real celebrity here. So I'm a big star in that surfing community, and there is a real surfing community in Second Life. Wow. Um, hundreds and hundreds of people that surf, and there's dozens and dozens of great surfing spots all different kinds of ways, all different kinds of boards, different shapers make different. The same thing as real life, except that it's second life and it's virtual. And then you get the guy say, oh, that ain't really surfing, man. That's just cartoonish animation crap, man. It ain't surf. Well, you know what? Those are the same kind of people that said to me, 
Oh, you can't surf in Lake Michigan, man. You got to go to California, Hawaii. There's no waves in Lake Michigan. You can't surf there. You know, it's the same attitude. You yeah. got to be a pioneer. You got to say, oh, screw you. I'm, I'm doing it and I'm having fun. I don't care if you call it surfing or hopscotch. I'm out there <laughs> having fun. And, uh, you know. And it's funny, too, if it's Great Lakes surfers telling you that. Oh, yeah, there is. Yeah. <laughs> Some of my best friends. Yeah. I'll name one. I'm Don Freefeld. I mean, I, God, he's, been, <laughs> he's a surfing god, in my opinion. You know, he's a really yeah. great, great, great guy, great friend. And I was at a, oh, we have our Super Bowl party. We did tell before the pandemic. Uh, you don't have to worry about your injuries in the. Uh, no, and paddling out, right? Derek paddling out, it's no problem. Oh, you don't yeah. get tired. You bash right through waves and you don't feel the wipeouts. Um, wow. And you can surf all day and every day is perfect. There's no, oh, too windblown, man. Too choppy yeah. going over here. No, it's per perfect waves, perfect everything. And you get the full. And then I got to thinking to myself, well, Okay, all your rides that you get in real life, I don't like call it real life. That's called physical life. You, all your rides you got in physical life, and I can remember my best uh, the ones I really remember. And then all the rides I got in second life, I can remember. And pretty soon, it doesn't matter if I did them in second life or I did them in real life. They're in my memory bank. I did them. I did them. I thought I did them. I thought I was surfing. That's good enough. I don't need to actually. I mean, how many good dreams have you had? Really good dreams. And Good you know point. what? Yeah. They're in your memory bank. You remember having them and they're great dreams. I mean, you might as well have done them, actually done them because you dreamed them. You thought you were doing them at the time. You're what's right. It, it was an experience. You're right. Yeah. yeah. What's the difference if you're, if you're going to stand on your board and, and balance yourself on a few square centimeters of your feet mm -hmm. and turn your board and do all that, that if you're going to use a couple of millimeters on that, your fingertips to operate a keyboard or a mouse, I mean, what's the difference? It's, it's actually, if you had one sense, you got five senses. If you had one that you could not do without surfing, it wouldn't be smell. You could do without smell. You could do without um, hearing, sound. The one you can't do without is sight. Yeah. The actual sight of it. And if you've got the same sight of it in second life as you do in real life, uh, I mean, it's funny. I paddling out in second life and there's a wave ahead on me that's, it's way overhead, and it doesn't look like I'm going to make it. It's going to break right on me. I get actually kind of scared. Really? Even though I'm just, it's just me. <laughs> That's how real it becomes after a while. So wow. um, I surf like crazy in Second Life, yeah. yeah. And I'm, uh, I do pretty good in the contest. It's just funny. I do about as good in this. I do about fourth place in a surfing contest in Second Life. And that's about what I did in the GLSA contest, about fourth place. I never was the best. Mm -hmm. I was good enough to be, you know, with the cool guys, you know, yeah. the guys that were good, and but not, not, uh, not the worst, not the um, lame uh, dude that just doesn't seem to do very good at all, you know. Yeah. So, um, I was respectable. That's the word I was looking for. I always could, and that's all. I never really wanted to win a contest. I never did, and um, I mean, I tried to, but I never. I wasn't broken hearted because I didn't win win the contest. I always wanted yeah. to just be respectable. I wanted to be up there with the guys that were good. I didn't have to be the best, but I wanted to be with that gang. You know, there's a lot of camaraderie out there, and you know, you don't want to be the laggard. You know, so you was surfing point. when you felt, when you discovered surfing with the wage makers. Had you been involved in other sports or anything, or was yeah this, yeah okay? It's funny. Um, R.C. Allen, Rick Sapinski were the founders of the Great Lakes Surfing Association. And I was one of the pioneers. And we all three were pole vaulters in high school, at the same high school. Oh. And I didn't have nothing to do with them in high school. They were a couple of years before me. Interesting. Younger than me. And uh, we were all pole vaulters for what I, whatever reason. Um, I, yeah, I was like I say, I was a snow skier, scuba diver, water skiing, a uh, bunch of stuff. Track and field, pole vault. But surfing yeah. sort of the buck stopped at surfing, I guess. Oh yeah. For that quite was a life, while. That was a life changer. For Ray Wagemaker, no. Um, two years later it was motorcycles because that was the next cool thing. He was oh, after okay. the cool thing. And uh, Dave Wagemaker, no, he was different. Him and I 
did the Robert August, Mike Kinson, and the summer thing down in Mexico. And we really dug that. But then he faded out of that. He got it. Started a ministry or something. Oh, okay. He did pretty good. I think he started out as a motivational speaker. He made a lot of money doing that, but he found out there's even more money in being a minister. And so he started a minister. <laughs> wow. And, and that's what he's doing now. Ray Wagemaker, no, he's still the same guy. He's still he's still that movie star that never Is made it? a movie. I mean, mm. he's still he's always playing some character. He was James Coburn one time. He was uh peter fonda he had peter fonda's motorcycle from easy rider i mean he didn't okay. have the actual motorcycle but he had a replica exactly like it and he looked like peter fonda i'm imagining like a james dean or a tab hunter kind of thing but no, no he's, uh, um, peter fonda so okay peter fonda yeah james dean was a little bit before our times okay he was that cool teenager dude uh before we were actually teenagers we might have been 12 not 13 teenagers, but that was just a, that was like my little older brother um, was, uh, but we, we dug it. I mean, we're old enough to, you know, we could see this is cool. We didn't really know what cool was until we were about 13, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 13. Then all of a sudden things had to be cool. You had to wear that cool jacket, you know, things. It wasn't like you just put on the whatever clean clothes you had in your drawer. You put on what was cool, what looked cool. Gotcha. You were cool because you wore that stuff. I mean, that's the way he went. Yeah. I, I, I never really got into that. So was your brother, uh, Will, is he older yep. or younger? Uh, he's younger. Younger, okay. Yeah. One, uh, one year I was all set to go to South Carolina or North Carolina surfing, and I was all set to go. My mom says, no, you got to go with your sister, younger sister, married to on a student tour to Europe. And I thought, oh, oh, Europe. Uh no, nah, I'm gonna go surfing. I don't go to Europe, but it was only like six hundred dollars for a two month trip. That's airfare and everything, all the meals, hotel, and everything. So I got on a four engine plane. We lost two engines on the way over during an airplane strike. We had emergency land. I nice. thought we were gonna all die on that flight. Yeah, it was old Saturn Airlines. Yeah, it looked like they made their airplanes out of old Greyhound buses. I mean, you could still see wow. the Greyhound dog just barely underneath the paint of Saturn Airlines. <laughs> it's like they built the planes out of old Greyhound buses or something. They were just a worse looking. I mean, jets were just starting to come in, but no, we had the prop plane, four props. Wow. And uh, so I went on that. In the meantime, so my I was gone. My board was sitting down there in the basement. My brother decided he's going to just take it out and start going surfing with it, you know? And that's how he got started. <laughs> just grabbed my board. I went to Europe that summer and he took my board and went surfing. That's how you got started. Oh, that is really cool. Now, I heard you bring up earlier about you You were mentioning Grand Haven, Michigan as Surf City. And now I've also seen that people, it seems like there might be a bit of a rivalry here with Sheboygan, um, Wisconsin for that not, title. Not, yeah, not really a rivalry. I mean, as far as nothing, I mean, Larry and, and Lee are like bros, you know, I mean, yeah, 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 there's not, not anything like, and it's not that serious of a rivalry, but yeah, uh, we were the center of the universe because it was a home place, the Great Lakes Surfing Association. It was pretty accessible to more states and more surfers, and Sheboygan is stuck up in a corner, kind of. I see, yeah. and uh, Grand Haven was more, no, it was on the main peninsula here, and uh, it was kind of the center of the universe where all the contests were. They came to our contests. We never went to them for any reason. Oh, okay. Then we event I did eventually go to the Dairyland Surf Classics. Yeah. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. But no, everybody came to us. And and another thing, Rick and RC and the, RC and the Great League Surfers, they went out and evangelized. They, they got in the vans. And I, I think I gave you a picture of them leaving for the East Coast. And they traveled all around the Great Lakes spreading the good word of surfing, the gospel. Really? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, they really <laughs> like Jehovah's worked. Witness, but they worked, great, like, yeah, they worked, and worked on and they didn't wear the white shirts and ties, but they they were out there <laughs> they wore the wetsuits. That's what they wore as wetsuits. So, Bob, you this picture, by the way, is awesome. So I'm looking at this picture that you said was featured in Sports Illustrated. Yeah, it made this. Sports okay. Illustrated. Sir. So my question is, I mean, you know, this is this is quite a while ago and here we are 2021 and we're still defending the fact that you can surf the great lakes oh yeah yeah i mean 
Sure, you can tell so, anybody. <laughs> um, well, since the movie Step in the Liquid, um, they did a pretty good job. They really did, yeah. Yeah, and uh, showing uh, what we had. I thought were, that was pretty accurate about kind of what we had, what we surfed, and how we surfed, not how those pros surfed in the kind of the movie, but how yeah. we kind of surf. Although I will say that our we have like um, uh, Matt Simonski that our, I, I meant to say something at the beginning of this podcast about Matt because I watched that video last night for you know tune in on this and he's a little bit modest. <laughs> yeah, he might sound a little bit, but he's about okay. outspoken, but actually he's pretty modest. He was a f- fabulous surfer. You ask me, he says, Doc, well, who's the best surfer you ever saw surf in the rock pile? And it's hard to say the best because there were really great surfers like Jack Robinson. Um, but they surfed on different equipment than Matt surfs on. And the yeah. surfing was different when they surfed than when Matt is surfing. Uh, Matt is, if I had one guy to watch out there, it would be Matt Smolensky. I mean, mm-hmm. there was days I was out there surfing where I just stopped surfing. I just stood there and watched him surf. I thought, wow, yeah. what am wow. I doing? This guy's <laughs> fabulous. The thing is with Matt is I surf with his older, you know, I mean, his, older brother, his dad. I surf with John yeah. Smolensky. And and John's actually a little, a little younger than I am. Uh, there was the first generation surfers, which are a bunch of the old guys like Rick and me, all about the same age. Then there was another, and you can't call them second generation surfers, but they're just a little bit young, quite a bit younger, maybe four or five years younger than us. And that would have been like John Smolensky and Ben Freefelt, a bunch of those guys. And the dividing line was in the juniors. They had the juniors division of the contest and they had the seniors division. So those guys were like in juniors, but you don't call them a second generation. They were first generation surfers. But I surfed with John Smolensky. And then uh, as time goes on, we start surf the rock pile in 1970. Uh, the first person to surf that was Tommy Law and Bob Pushaw. I was the first one to surf the rights, which is basically what they surf now. I had named the rock pile, the rock pile. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, I, I had John Smolensky there. He got married and, and then uh, his wife had a baby. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he took the baby and wheeled him out in a baby stroller onto the pier. <laughs> Not out where it get washed off, no, but at the approach to the pier. Yeah. So he could watch the surfers. And that was little John Molensky. So when we get done surfing a wave, you go back on the pier, you walk back out, but you walk past that little stroller. And every time I walk by, your hands are wet. So I'd flick a little water at that baby's face. <laughs> and his and a smile would come, and his eyes would glow, and a smile would come on, and his ears would kind of wiggle. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and that kid laid in that baby stroller. All that time, I mean, the whole time we were surfing there, maybe six, seven hours in that baby stroller. Wow. And there's a secret to riding the rock pile, like John said, or Matt said, that place is a mess. If you came in there, you thought, God, how do you surf this? Yeah. Well, even if you're good at surfing it, there's days that you just don't catch any waves. Not John. I'm not talking about Matt. Matt, he always catches waves. I don't care what it is, but. Yeah. A lot of us are good at it, and it's still there's days that we just don't catch any waves. We're sitting there. We're not getting, you have to get clued in on the rhythm of the place. There's a rhythm to the waves. The waves come in, they hit along the pier, and they bounce back, and they hit the next wave coming in, and it forms like a bowl. And there's a rhythm to it. And if you get in that rhythm, you can get zoned. I mean, you're going to nail one wave right after another. And it happens to all of us. So it's happened to me. And, well, you go back running out the pier, and you got people cheering you and patting you on the back way to go wow you know people have just never even seen surfers before mm-hmm. and 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 that's that's what matt could do is he as being a baby there he caught that rhythm from the waves hitting the pier because when you're standing on the pier you can kind of feel the waves hitting it and that little baby in that stroller caught the rhythm of that lake at a very infant age wow and they say most of your behavior patterns are formed before you're like what was it six years old or three years old? I don't okay. know. And uh, that kid had gotten that rhythm in his system before that. And I can't remember that guy not being good surfer. I don't wow. remember. He said he surfed when he was eight years old. I really don't remember him when he was eight years old. But all of a sudden, he popped on the scene and he was really, really good. And he, yeah. and he is really, really good. If you go out there today and uh, he's just a fantastic surfer. And as far as the number of lives he saved, no, he didn't save no 25 lives. He's 
probably closer to 50 at least. He sold, he saved about 20 in one day one time. You had a wow. bunch of, during Coast Guard Festival, you had a bunch of drunks jumping off the pier. And he, they were jumping off and they couldn't get back up. And the waves were bashing them in the pier. And Matt took every one, one by one. He took them all into shore. Um, wow, you were more really than 25 people. His, uh, you were really debunking his modesty today. Oh, yeah. he. I listened to that interview. And he's very modest about the things and, and how good of a surfer he is. Because he is really, really good. I've and, seen the videos. And so I could tell his skill level is quite The only incredible. thing I could say is, when I surfed with him a lot, I was one of those guys that took him and showed him some of the spots that we were surfing further north and south and that. And uh, he was a smaller guy. And same thing with uh, a couple other surfers there that were really good surfers. They were young. I didn't. But but all of a sudden, they grew another foot and a half. Have you ever had many friends like that? That you didn't see for a little while, and all of a sudden they're like a foot and a half taller. Yeah. Because I was wondering why John is not that tall, but or John's really tall. His dad's really tall, but John Matt was not very tall. But then all of a sudden I didn't see him for a few years, and then I see him, and wow, he grew another couple feet. Wow. I thought, holy smokes! <laughs> and the same thing with Marty Karish. He, he was just, you know, kind of a normal sized guy and stuff like that. The other day he came over here. I had a board for him, and I thought it was a sure what he'd want. And he's a great big giant guy steps out of his car at the wall. How how these people get so tall? Well, one thing is I found out I used to be five foot ten. I went to the doctor. I've been going to the doctor a lot lately. So, no, you're only five foot eight. So, oh, you shrunk. <laughs> he said you shrunk two inches. Like, <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> I I tell you, you don't want to get old. It's just no fun. I thought it would be right. cool when I got old. I'd have a big white beard. I'd tell old Mexico surf stories to people and and um, and smoke my pipe and just, you know, have a little bottle of whiskey next to me and just, you know, just have a merry old time. I write my memoirs. No, it's basically taking pills, going to the doctor's office, surgery. Uh, you're just a wreck. You're like you're Whoa. like one of my old Volkswagen vans. I had three of them. And after a while, they keep fixing them. You keep fixing them and fixing them and fixing them. But towards the point, at one point, you say, no, I can't fix this anymore. It goes to the <laughs> junkyard. You take it out to the junkyard. Wow. And that's and that's kind of with the human body. Well, you're not selling me on aging here. I kind of want to stay at 38 now. Oh, stay at 38, man. If there's some sort of pill you can take or something. Um, now, here's the thing is. I'm a little bit late for this, but you might be the first generation in history that actually does have a choice between immortality and death. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little bit too old for that. I think I'm going to miss the technological um, thing there. Well, but, you will live on in second life, man. Yeah, I can't even <laughs> breathe. I can't even suck in air, much less life. <laughs> I, I'm having trouble breathing. I'm on breathing steroid right now. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I have to take them. Otherwise, I can't breathe. Ah. I was inactive for so long. It wasn't smoking. I did smoke, but I didn't really inhale. And I just puffed on these little cigar cigarettes yep. for quite a few years. But they never had any much of an effect on me. Mm. But then I noticed after I just sat in front of my computer for 12 to 14 hours a day in Second Life, I was living in the Second Life. But my first life was going to hell. I wasn't doing anything. My muscles all became nothing. And yeah. I couldn't, my breathing, I didn't have the muscles in me to even breathe. Because when you're in Second Life, you're not breathing much. You're just sitting there still. At your yeah. computer and that's where i'm at now is i'm trying to regain my breath and little by little i'm trying to get back at it and all these steroid things i've taken some powder stuff you inhale it just keeps you breathing through the day it doesn't improve you you're not going to be a stronger breather because you keep doing this stuff it's just going to make you stronger for the time that you're taking it you've got to heal your own self um and that's hopefully what it's going to do is i'm going to be able to exercise take the stuff and exercise and the exercise is going to make my lungs, my muscles for my lungs stronger and I can breathe better again. Absolutely. And go back out, maybe go back out surfing again. Yeah, let's I don't, get you in the first life. Uh, so I want to go surfing with you before you yeah. hang it up fully. Well, you could have about five of these podcasts of me and I would never stop talking. I tell you. <laughs> I'm not yeah, around. hardly scratch the surface. I'm not around <laughs> people very much. And, and when I do get around people, um, I pretty much, I was self-isolating before the pandemic. and. And now if I get around people, I just talk their heads off. So I, I saw Endless Summer when it came out. And I had a girlfriend, Kat Hatfield, back then. And I took her to see that movie 18 times in a row at the old RKO Regent Theater in Grand Rapids. 
three three performances a day for six days a week. And wow. she was my most loyal girlfriend that would go and sit and let me and watch that movie with me 18 times in a row, three times in a day. At the last performance, we'd walk out. No sex, man. I've got a headache. <laughs> and you know, it's like we were really, I mean, you had a headache from watching all day long, and we'd be right back to the next afternoon, the matinee, the next one, and then the next, well, well you had the seven o'clock show, and then you had the nine o'clock show. And it, actually later than that, because it lasted about three hours. And um, mm. that's what got me going. All of a sudden, wow, this is it. What's really funny, Derek, is uh, that movie really launched me into surfing. I mean, like you, it made me feel like I was part of something much bigger. Mm. And But what's funny about it is that movie led me into surfing. But at the end of my, towards the end of my surfing career, a movie i caught up with the movie i got to be in the second sequel step in a liquid yeah and there was dana brown bruce brown's son and i was mm -hmm. partying with him drinking beers and having fun yeah. and, and all of a sudden wow i caught up with the movie you know after all it's just a little old great like, lake surfer circle, not even the yeah. best great lake surfer just a great lake surfer and um i caught up with the one thing i always noticed though is is whenever we traveled and we went and surfed another country like mexico or someplace or california and the, the surfers there would always make room for us and they would say hey give the great lake surfers a, a wave you know because the places were dog eat dog i mean they'd, they'd punch you out if you dropped in on them you know what mm -hmm. i mean but they would say no let the lake surfers have a wave you know and or, you know, one of the bigger guys would say that and boy yeah. we'd say thank you thank you and we'd take off and so we're always special we, i you knew you're something like you say, there's something special about it, and there's something part of something bigger than you, and that's what it was for me. And that's a comic became my way of life. I, yeah, it really was. I mean, and it still is. It's just I'm not physically out there surfing anymore. But you know what? I tell my friends too. I said, you know, I really don't want to be some broken down old man fumbling around on a surfboard out there, mm. trying to stand up, falling down, and old gray hair, and just you know, you shouldn't be out here. You're messing up. You know, for me, when I started out, you were like an actor or a performer or something, especially in the 60s when you kind of danced around on your surfboard and did tricks and stuff. Yeah, you were a performer and, and, you know, you're putting on a show, you know what I mean? And yeah. it's time, there's time when you shouldn't be out there on the stage anymore. You just don't have to zip anymore, you know what I mean? With all the going's good, yeah. Yeah, and I, that's kind of way it kind of got for me. I just... I wasn't catching the waves I was catching earlier in my life. And I went, didn't have that zip and the, you know, that snap. Um, I was still having fun though. Boy, I'd have my moments. I get those rides and uh, I'd hoot and <laughs> as long as I could hoot, you know, but, um, and, uh, so Bob, you know, let's go to that. Let's go to that famous, uh, you know, everyone I've talked to, like people have said, you know, find out the story. I believe the same day that the Edmund Fitzgerald sunk, you were out there saving someone else's life. So tell me the well. It was not only story. the same day; it was the same hour that Fitz, when Fitz was plunging to the bottom, with twenty nine people on board, uh, we were out there at that exact same time, about six thirty at night, trying to uh, get those kids in. Um, that day was fantastic day. Uh, what's often forgotten about the rescue is the fact that the surfing, I mean, those were the biggest waves I ever surfed on Lake Michigan. And that was the biggest surf I'd ever seen on Lake Michigan. In fact, those are the biggest waves anybody had seen on Lake Michigan. You know, even guys that are in their 70s and 80s never saw waves that big. Wow. What were the were, wave? What were the wave heights recorded? Well, the winds were terrific that night. It blew down, blew the roof off part of my house. I had a house out in Spring Lake. Actually, a chicken coop was made into a house. <laughs> blew part of the roof of that off, and so Bob Pushaw came by and he says, "Doc, we got to go out and look at the waves," you know. And he drove out, and uh, I don't know if we rode in his car. We took two cars anyway. We drove out to Grand Haven State Park. We drove out. We walked out to the pier and we looked at it and we thought there's no are we going to go surfing or not there's no question we were not going to go surfing no, mm. nobody was going surfing in those waves see they, they were huge they were they were stacked up all the way to the horizon as far as you could see and every one of them oh man past that past the lighthouse I'm, I'm saying they were all 20 feet 
wow. every every single wave, and, and then just wave after wave after wave, all the way out to the horizon. They were huge, and when they came in, I and mean, they were bigger than 20, 20 feet. I'm just going to say twenty feet. Yeah. Um, but when we stood there and we watched them, now normally on a big day at Grand Haven, you and you'll see pictures of if you Google up Grand Haven Pier, you'll see pictures of waves exploding, hitting the pier, and the water flying. You know, like old faithful geyser or something like that. Just stupendous exhibit of water, cement colliding together. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But no, not that day. That day, the waves were so big, they just crushed over to the signal house at the end. They didn't splash up. They were too big to splash up. They just rolled over it. And if you were on the catwalk, which is oh, a good 20 feet up above, you would have got washed off that catwalk. Those waves washed over the end of that pier across the Grand Haven Channel, across the North Pier, and broke on the North Shore. Wow. That's how big and powerful those waves were. <laughs> and there's no way anybody, I don't care who you are, was going to make it out there and ride those waves. They yeah. were just too big, too powerful. And Bob, Bob and I looked at each other, we thought Port Sheldon, because Port Sheldon isn't a federal pier. It wasn't built by the federal government. That's a owned by Consumers Power and built by them. And it's a taller pier. Uh, then they have some sort of budget they were under. They just had to build a good pier and they built a good pier, it's a tall pier. And we thought that'll hold the swell. That way we can surf inside the pier, you know, in, the, in that little harbor there. And that's what we did. And then Chuck got me took some, there's some pictures of it. Um, but anyway, um, it shows us surfing inside the pier, overhead stuff uh, at Port Sheldon. In the background, you can see the actual lake surf, and they do look kind of big, but it's deceiving because that pier is so big and so tall. It makes the piers, it makes the waves behind them look some, actually smaller than what they really are. Oh, okay. they, they were huge. And, and so we surfed there all the way up till around 5, 5 5.30 or so. Um, and then we decide, let's go back up to Grand Haven. Maybe it's starting to shape up up there and line up a little bit so we can at least try to ride it. And sure enough, uh, I drove up there and I just seen, I thought, wow, it's still really big, but not like it was before. It was huge. I mean, it was mm -hmm. gigantic, but it was it was rideable. And then I seen Whitey, Steve White, the late Steve White, just ripping across a, a section there at his little spot. And okay. I thought, I can do that. Yeah. Because I had surfed waves like that in Mexico that previous year. It's funny, but us Great Lake surfers, we actually pioneered a surfing spot in Mazatlan, Mexico, that the really? Mexicans didn't even dare to ride. And we rode it, and they started coming over and ride it just because we were riding it. Great Lake surfers were riding it. But it was a point break. It broke pretty much right on rocks, but it was just a beautiful, big, huge wave. Half of them would close out, half of them would peel off. Yeah. Anyway, I thought, I've ridden uh, Loopy's rides. So I can ride this. I can do this. I had to convince myself a little bit. Whitey's doing it. I taught Whitey kind of how to surf. I didn't teach him how to surf. He just, I gave him my board and he went out and surfed. Um, and I thought, I could do this. So I, I'll just stick to Whitey. I've seen guys out further by the lighthouse. I said, nah, I didn't go out there. So um, I ran out there and, and uh, I was surfing with Whitey. And then I came in. I was going back out. It was getting late, though. It was getting quarter after six, six, six thirty almost. And I was sitting there with Burrow and resting there on the rocks. And then Somebody, there's some action going on out by the lighthouse. And so Burl says, hey, I got to go out there. And I, I didn't think what, what he was talking about. So I went back. I followed him out there. But then I got off where Whitey was surfing. He kept going out to the end. And then Joey White couldn't surf because he had a broken wrist. Come running down the catwalk. And he says, hey, somebody got washed off. You guys got to come and, and help. And uh, Whitey's turned to me. He says, Doc, we got to go save him. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> I was kind of scared just even being out there, but I was riding waves. I mean, the biggest yeah. waves I ever rode there. And so we just took the first couple of waves we could get to surf in and run out. And I I did not dare to look at those waves. I looked down at Whitey's feet. He's ahead of me. And I just seen his wet footprints on the pier and me right behind him. And he went off the side of the pier into the water and I went off the side of the pier into the water. I looked first. I seen him. Burl Eastling was in the water with a couple kids hanging on his board you know they were fully clothed kids hanging on his board teenagers and uh, i could kind of size up what the scene was so whitey and i got to him and we each took one of the kids on our boards i put the kids up on the boards and then we stayed in the water because you couldn't get two people on the boards i mean they had they didn't have anything 
they had to be on the boards, otherwise they would have been drowning. Yeah. In fact, one kid did drown before we even got out there. He went down. We never even saw him. No. He went down, uh, Dan Brown. He went down before we even got out there. And we had those two kids on there. And we didn't know what the hell to do. The waves were coming in. I mean, it was all out there by the lighthouse. It was wasn't quite out to the lighthouse right there. It was almost halfway out to the lighthouse on the landing. Um, we didn't know what to do. We couldn't get them back to the pier because if you got them over to the pier, the waves would just slam us and the kids right into yeah. the side of the pier. Yeah, pier bounce. T- turn us into hamburger, yeah. yeah. So we uh, we paddled away from the pier a little bit, but then we got sucked out. Um, that maybe it was that um, structural rip current there. It's, it's not that strong, but it'll carry you along. It carries back out towards the lighthouse. And so we try to get them paddled back in, back towards where it was next to the pier. But I don't know why we were doing that because we knew we weren't going to bring them up on the pier. There's just no way we could have done that. And But we had to do something because we didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sounds strange, but we had to do something. So we just kept getting sucked out paddling back out to that paddling back into that spot next to the pier but then not doing anything and then uh oh man we must have been doing that for a good hour and a half or at least it was a long time because wow. it was pitch black i mean when when it all happened the sun was just going down yeah but by the time it got towards the end of it uh it was pitch black out and then the waves were lifting us up so high when it come in that we could look over the top of the catwalk into the channel we could see the coast guard boat 40 foot coast guard boat trying to come out uh, and it's going stern on bow. I mean, up and down, up and down over these yeah. waves trying to get out there. And then it, I didn't, you know, I looked at it. I thought, what can they do? They're going to get killed if they try to go around that pier head. Yeah. And the captain knew that too. So he turned around, went back later. He said it was engine problems, but no, it wasn't. <laughs> a problem. He would have got killed. His whole crew would have got killed uh, going around that pier head. And so we thought, what are we going to do? And we panicked, we screamed and stuff for a while. <laughs> and after a while, it, it, we just you get really relaxed. When you really know you're probably going to die, yeah. you really get relaxed. It's really, really a relaxed feeling. In fact, I've had drowning victims that research, research, they had smiles on their faces when they found the bodies. Oh. Uh, it's really, it's something weird, but, and your yeah. life does pass in front of you. I don't know why we thought we were going to drown because there was at any point in that rescue, I'm sure that both Whitey, Burl, and myself could have ditched those kids and just paddled and surfed in. Yeah. We, we'd, we'd have got tumbled and wiped out. So what we would have got in, we had tethered surf boards and we would have got in. Uh, we weren't going to die that way. The way you're going to die is if we had tried to get them in next to the pier, yeah, we could all got killed, get slammed into the pier. Or the worst thing, and this is something to remember, and this is kind of what happened. Um, I'll jump back a little bit. Uh, when we saw the Coast Guard boat turn around and go back, we thought we got to do something. We screamed a lot, panicked a lot. Then we all settled down. We said, we're going to have to take them in through the break. And we just looked at each other like, uh, yeah, that's too bad because we're going to lose them. I mean, we didn't say that, but it was pretty much understood that we ain't going to make it if we take them in through the break because we're going to lose both of them. So we started, I said, Burl, I said, you stay in the middle, Wetty, on that side, I'll be on this side. And we all three, three boards start paddling in and we started getting in where the waves were forming up and breaking. And all of a sudden one wave just picked up all five of us. Whitey had, okay, Whitey was paddling and he had his guy holding onto his legs, which is a pig, no, no. You never want to bring a guy in like that holding onto your legs. He's dragging them like in his pad, so he had both arms free for paddling. I was had my guy on the board and I was laying on top of my guy, like had him in a kind of uh, like a crab thing, you know what I mean? I was paddling with my arms. And Burl was in between both of us to help either one of us if we needed it. And if I had it to do over again, I told Burl to hang back and take the next couple waves in. And then that way he'd be behind us and been able to see who was in trouble and got to him. As it turned out, I thought it would be me that he'd end up helping him, but it wasn't, it was Whitey. What happened, the first wave hit us, picked all five of us up and just slammed us into the sandbar. I thought I, I snapped my neck. Oh, no. I thought I broke my neck and um, lost my victim off the board. I thought, well, I tried to save him, you know, that's, that's that, because it's just not gonna happen. I come up and there he is, his head's bobbing in the water. And one thing fortunate, the waves were so big that the time interval between waves is 
oh, close to 12 seconds as opposed to four or five seconds, which yeah. it normally is, is like 12 seconds. So there's quite a bit of time. There's 10, 12 seconds, which is a lot of time yeah. uh, to, for me to paddle over and get them back on my board again. And then the next wave would pick us up and just slam me back in the sandbar again. And I thought, Sam, you come back up. There's his head's bobbing in the water again. So I paddled back over, got him back on the board again. And the next wave hit us. And that happened three or four times. Wow. And then pretty soon, and there, I couldn't see if we're getting closer to shore because there were so many lights on the shore. The fire department, Coast Guard, everybody was there with spotlights. And the whole place was just lit up, and I couldn't see which way it was which. And I heard Burley yell to me, hey, Doc, you're going the wrong way. You're going down the beach. You're not coming in. And so I turned around, and finally I felt that sand underneath my feet. And I thought, oh, my God. I made it. <laughs> and my guy was still on the board there. And I gave him a little push and tied my cord. And, and the fireman guys come running out in the water and they picked him up and carried him in to the E unit. So and how then, much uh, time were you doing this battle back and forth until you finally got him in? Well, the real battle part where we're getting crushed by the waves, that probably wasn't any more than about five minutes or so. Oh, five okay. minutes and that kind of uh, crap is a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I must have got hit by about five or six waves like that where I just lost the board, lost him, lost everything. Um, in the first three or four ways, I thought I broke my neck and I'd get slammed into the sandbar. And the other way is really big and powerful. And um, yeah, it's maybe five or six minutes. It wasn't, well, actually, because I was paddling a little bit, maybe it was longer than that, maybe about seven minutes or so. But it wasn't more than 10 minutes, yeah. that part of it. But the other part was a struggle, a constant paddling, trying to get those kids back towards the pier. And because we get sucked out by the lighthouse, that got scary when we got out that far. Yeah. Then you kind of wondered even if we were going to make it, even if we had to ditch the kids in. And I got to say that it crossed our minds. I didn't, we didn't speak of it, but I think we all thought of it like, hey, we can get out of this if we just yeah. get to these kids, yeah. you know what I mean? But yeah. no, we didn't. We stuck with it. We wanted to get them in. Yeah. And um, they were brothers. And right before we made the break for sure, the one said, are you okay, Doug? And they said, yeah, I'm okay. They're brothers. And uh, the thing is with Whitey, though, uh, when that first wave picked off five of us up and slammed us into the sandbar, his shock cord broke, his leash. So he's lost okay. his board. His board went on. They saw Whitey's board come in first. They didn't see any of us until they saw Whitey's board come in. And they thought, oh, my God, that's That's not board. a good sign, yeah. It, because Whitey was an all-state swimmer. I mean, he was super water man, athlete. I mean, you know, he was the, guy, the man, you know. And if his board was coming in, that means we're all dead you know? <laughs> yeah. and actually it came on the news uh, on monday night football um I, during halftime my parents were in grand rapids watch this there's five surfers just drowned on the grand even so oh, no. my mom and dad thought both all we lost both their sons yeah. you know and uh so whitey board came in and uh what happened was is once he lost the board and this is something to remember for anybody who wants to try to save somebody from drowning is uh, it's what they call the dead man's embrace. And that's the deal where if if you're by a person that's drowning, they're going to grab you. They're going to start climbing on you. They want stability. They want flotation. And they're going to start, I don't care if it's your own brother, your mother, or whatever. They're going to, their instincts for survival is really strong. And they, they will not say, well, I'm not going to climb on him because I might drown him. I'll just drown by myself. No, they don't think that way. They want to save themselves. And that's kind of what happened. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but Whitey had to kind of keep his distance from the guy because the guy, every time Whitey got close to him, the guy would start climbing on him. Yeah. Um, and he had to keep his distance. And um, and if they get you, this is something I learned a long, not too long ago, is don't try to go up, go down. They'll, they'll loosen your grab on you. If you're going down, they want to go up. Oh, so if, you go, if you go down, they'll, they'll let go of you because they don't want to go down. They want to go up. Yeah. So you just go down, swim underwater, and go away from them and come back up. But always try to keep your flotation device or whatever you got between you and the victim. Um, okay. I had mine tethered, and I came up behind my victim. He didn't see me. Mm -hmm. He was in the water, or his head bobbing in the water. I came up behind him and kind of bumped him almost. And Oh, there's the board. So he naturally just grabbed the board instead of grabbing me. Yeah. If you grab me, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. Yeah, exactly. Even with the even with the leash on, he would have still taken me down, drowned me, and much bigger. And I I never was a really big, strong dude or anything. Where mm. you know, not very good at like, fighting somebody. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, you, you want to. That's one thing you always want to be careful of is don't 
I don't care who it is. It might be your best friend. They're going to grab you. Yeah, it's just an instinct. Because you can have two mm-hmm. drowning victims. And if you do get caught, go down. Don't go up. Try to go down beneath the guy. And he'll let go of you. Because he doesn't want to go down with you. Yeah. He wants to go up. So that's one. That's just something to remember. But yeah, that's what happened. And then uh, the guy wasn't very far from shore. I mean, Whitey says they were within 50 feet of them standing up. Mm. You know, yeah. uh, it, it just it just really sad. And it really bothered Whitey for the rest of his life. We just lost Whitey, um, what, a year ago. Oh, okay. He passed away. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, he'd always call me up every November 10th. He'd say, Doc, I don't know if it's Gerald Day. I said, oh, yeah. Uh, and then we always talk about something. And I'm still finding things out about that rescue yeah. that I never knew before. It's um, kind of neat. You guys had that check-in on that sort of We do. And day. then I I tried to call Renault's as what his wife. And uh, I I get an email through to her usually. That call The phone number is not the same anymore. And yeah, now you I miss, guys I miss received, uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah, he is a great. Great surfer, all-around athlete. The way I first knew him, he was part of the Whitey White, White Water Ski Show back in the 50s and early 60s. There was what we called the Water Whitey White Water Ski Show on, in the Grand Haven Channel. And all the city would come out and the tourists would watch the Whitey White Water Ski Show. The guy's going over jumps and doing tricks and all that stuff. And then in the part of the show, they said, here comes little Stevie White. And he was only like three or four years old. And he's water skiing, with blonde hair and... Uh, Skiing down the channel, spotlights on him, and all that. <laughs> Little Stevie White. And I never saw him again until I was down in Mexico, and he was about 17, 18 years old. And he was down in Mexico with a couple other guys that come down to visit us, Michigan surfers. We had like a colony down there. And um, he shows up and he says, Hey, Doc, I know I've watched you surf and all that, and I want to surf too. And uh, can I use your board? And I says, no, you can use my board, but not here, Whitey. This is Lupe's rights. You know, the place I was telling you about that Mexicans didn't even dare surf until the Great League surfer showed them how. Yeah. Um, you know, and I said, not here, um, Steve. This, this is really dangerous. He says, no, I'll be careful. I'll be, and, and I'm really a persuasive guy. He says, okay, here, take my board. <laughs> I thought, wow, that was stupid. I said, I should never. And then he paddled out. And he paddled through the wave. I thought, wow, that's pretty good. He paddled right through the wave. And then uh, he got out there, spun around, paddled, took off, stood up, hit his bottom turn. I mean, it was like he'd surfed. Oh, he did it. And, uh, one of the first tries. He's just a natural, you know, he's water skiing since he was only three years old. And um, yeah. it's natural for him. The only other person like that was Kiki Cutter. She was a woman's gold medal China slalom skier. I taught how to surf down in San Blas. And she stood up on her first wave and just... Oh, nothing. This is nothing. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and so he just went on and he became really, really good surfer. That's a come. I don't like to say Matt's better than Whitey or Matt's I better see. than Jack Robinson because Matt's on a different kind of board than what we use. We, yeah. we had seven foot boards and he's riding six foot boards, five, I don't know, really little potato chips, I call them. It does yeah. nothing compared to what we used to ride. And um, and he's just tops on those things. Nobody he does stuff that we can't do on our bigger boards that he can do on that little board. And uh, so I know I, I can't compare them. But Whitey was really, really he had his own little spot there, and he had that spot wired. Yeah. He's not sitting around out there. He wouldn't sit for any more than 10, 20 seconds, and he'd have another wave and just one right after another. Really good form. Uh, really good act. Really good. So this was Whitey, the water skiing boy yeah. on TV. When yeah. You, you rescued the. Uh, yeah. The yeah. And he kind of led the rescue out there, actually. Although Burl was the first one. Burl was just a little guy. And he had both the bigger kids on his board. Uh, Burl was actually the first one in the water. They got them both on their boards. And then Whitey and I came along about a few minutes later. And then we split the victims up between us. Um, but Whitey was like, yeah, one time when he says, I'll go in and get help. And then we said, no. And I said, no, you're not, you're not going in. You're staying with us. You know, thinking back on the whole thing, the next year I was surfing, in, uh, uh, wind surfing in the exact same spot that the rescue happened on a perfectly calm day. There's hardly any wind. Wind surfer hardly even move. And the Marine Patrol dudes come up next to me. Hey, you're supposed to be wearing a personal flotation device, life preserver on a boat. And I was on a windsurfer and I had my wetsuit on. 
Yeah. I said, I got my wetsuit on. That, that'll float me. And they didn't say nothing to it. Yeah. And I, they drove off. And I said, you know, why didn't somebody take give somebody? There was other surfers there that didn't come out. Why didn't mm. they give one of those surfers a couple life jackets? You know, once they had an hour and a half to go get them a couple life jackets, give them to that surfer. We could have strapped those life jackets on those two kids. And at least they would have found the body. Yeah, they didn't really. find the body for another whole year, but they at least uh, found the body. Um, but he would have might have survived too. He might have just washed in after after Whitey lost his board. He might have just washed in. He was in the washing area. He's beyond the. He wasn't a breaking part anymore. He was in the wash wash area. He just washed in. But um, nobody thought of getting a life a life uh, jacket. <laughs> you know, although it's a law that if you went out. And a boat or something you're supposed to have one. I mean, why were life yeah. jackets so important if they wouldn't have thought of? Another thing is too is the Coast Guard didn't know what to do. Half the guys in the Coast Guard don't even know how to swim. Um, they uh, they just were not equipped for it back when the, you had the United States Life Saving Service back in the in the 19th century. Um, they knew how to rescue. Now they would have got a boom off the side of the pier, off the catwalk. They would have rigged rigged a boom, a rescue boom, like they do on the oh, side okay. of a ship, and they just dropped a. Um, a line on a pulley on the end of a boom and then it's, you just fish them out like a giant fishing pole and just swing them over and drop them on the pier. I, I mean, they could have taken down the, the flagpole at the state park and used that as a rescue boom. Just put the pulleys already on it from the flag. Uh, of course, I don't know if that would have held, but they could have rigged a line on that. And then that, because we could get them over next to the pier. We just couldn't get them over next to the pier. You know, I mean, right yeah. next to the pier. We could get them within 20 15, 20 feet up here, maybe even closer if we had to, but any closer than that, no, we'd run the serious risk of just losing everybody. Yes, yeah. I mean, just mangled up into hamburger. If, if uh, a way would have got us and sent us into the side. So, Bob, all these years later, all the people you've rescued, do you ever uh, see anybody anymore? Do you ever get to no, a and I, the mail or? Yeah, and I haven't rescued um, that many. I've oh. rescued maybe two or three three and only one real sure rescue and that was Doug Middleton and I had a chance to probably visit him when I'm on my way to the Dairyland Surf Classic one year he was up in Escanaba I thought but I was with some other people and they didn't want to stop they're anxious to get going and yeah. I, I kind of wish this day I would have gone in I was, I was hoping like maybe catch him at a bar or something and yeah walk in and and sit down next to him and say uh, I like a beer and I like a beer for this guy here yeah and then bartender says oh okay and then the then the Huda looked over and said, Whoa, who are you? <laughs> oh, I know you. Long time ago. Dirty an angel. You know, and then uh, I was hoping, you know, I kind of wish this day I would have done that, but I yeah. Uh, I, it's a stupid thing I got messed up in there. You know, you mentioned earlier that Endless Summer was your movie. That was the yeah. uh, you know, big time cult classic. Now, all these years later, here you are. Starring in Step in the Liquid, Dana Brown's film, Bruce's Son, that that sort of full circle experience. Right. So just tell me about, you know, what did that feel like? And did you get to meet, um, you know, in any of your, your dealings with that? Did you get to meet Bruce Brown or any of the other guys from the, oh, or well, Robert Dana, August? Or? No, I met Dana Brown. I mean, I okay. I didn't go to California with Larry and Lee. Went to California for a special show of that uh, get together, right. and I never was actually invited to that. I guess they just forgot about me or something. Oh, okay. But Dana did email me eventually, and I never responded to that. I kind of wish I did. But no, uh, I, I met Dana Brown. That was Bruce Brown's son, and uh, part of that whole thing, and it was a connection to the endless summer, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that was good for me. And then my favorite surfing movie was not the end of summer. My favorite surfing movie, and people, other surfers laugh when I tell them, it's Ride the Wild Surf. I mean, it's a dip you do plot. I mean, it's just, it's just like, uh, it's silly, you know, Fabian, I guess, and, and all that kind of stuff. It's not Gidget, though. It's not as bad as Gidget goes in that respect. Okay. Um, those were terrible surfing movies. Yeah. But, Ride the Wild Surf was kind of neat because it was actually kind of a real plot. It was California surfers thinking that they could go out and ride Hawaiian waves and having to meet up with the locals 
in the big kahuna there. And uh, it was supposed to be Greg, I don't know who he was supposed to be, Greg Miller or something. But anyway, they had to go through the locals, you know what I mean? It was a perfectly sensible plot, the big surf party, the guys trying to show off by jumping off the waterfall. That's all real stuff. That's real stuff surfers do. And the surfing was real. I mean, those were real guys like uh, Greg Nolan and stuff riding Waimea Bay when it was first being ridden. It was actually historical foot surf footage. And I love the plot. It was so simple. I love that movie. The one I didn't like that everybody does like is Point Break, where they dress up like a bunch of bank robbers and go rob banks. Surfers don't go rob banks. You know what I mean? Sure enough. Everybody yeah. go, oh, no, Point Break, man. That's, that's so cool. Uh, and I thought, oh, geez, you guys just don't get it, <laughs> I, you know? But that that's, is, each that his is, own, uh, you know, yeah. everybody likes their own thing, you know? Yeah, for sure. That's and, probably uh, my favorite movie, just because I love the uh, the action and the comedy in it. But I'm looking up Ride, Ride the Wild Surf here. because I've Oh, you got to watch that. I've never seen get, it, so. Yeah, you get a chance. Grab a beer out of the fridge yeah. and watch that. Because you're going to say, I see what Doc's talking about. It's very simple plot. Very, there's no secret messages nothing it's just basically guys want and love surfing yeah. give up anything to go surfing and uh and then they meet chicks and stuff and fall in love and that kind of stuff and it's just i love the cover the cover um it's that old sort of uh painted style and it says ride the wild surf yeah. going down the board and then it even says in color right on the nose That's yeah cool. yeah it was yeah. in color and there were many, not many movies in color back then. Yeah. It's in color, yeah. And uh, the, the theme song to it by Jan and Dean, Ride the Wild Surf, it made the top 10. Ride, uh, ride, ride the wild surf. Yeah. <laughs> well, I will that. take a, a little trip down uh, surfing history and check that out later. Yeah. And, you know, just take it for what it is, not for, I don't know, anything. You know, it's not like other surf movies. Yeah. But it's it's its own thing and it's cool. I just thought I liked it. I liked it. It had all the and it had all the elements of surfing in it. Simplistic, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but it's there. It's really it. You'll like it. What does your what does the Great Lakes Surfing Association look like these days? Are you the are you the president of it? Yeah, you... I am. Um there's others that have kind of taken up the banner. Uh, like in Facebook, there's a Great Lakes Surf Association Facebook page and all that kind of stuff, which is cool. So that's, that's, not, not, that's not you that? No, no. Oh, okay. but, but it is me in a way, but it isn't me. That's them. That's something they're doing, not me. Um, okay. The thing is, is uh, I, the, I got handed the, it gets handed down from, from Rick and RC. It got handed to Schultz. And it got handed down to a number of people who handled it well, kept the membership list, uh, the dues, all that kind of stuff, all the documentation. And then one day they decided, Doc, we want you to be president. Of and so they handed it all to me. And I got it. In fact, I'm looking at it right now on the shelf. It's sitting there on the shelf. And that's all the membership rules, all the documentation, all the old newsletters, all the stuff. And that's that. And I took the Surfing Association. The first thing I did with it is I formed the Great Lakes Surfing Association. We sponsored a, a participant in the Surf Rescue Project. That's in that website too. And you can see all of our uh, rescue, um, which Matt Smolensky was a big part of it, big part yeah. of that, and five other guys. And that's that's one thing we focused on. We didn't, I didn't want to do the same thing as the Eastern Surfing Association was doing under Lester Pride. He was having the contests and he was more organized and, and he had connections to the East Coast and the larger surfing associations but no i wanted yeah. the great lakes surfing association to be something different and something that was doing something that the other ones weren't and one of them was uh beach and pure rescue and then then after that others people took up that banner um and are doing that now great lakes rescue project or whatever yeah and, great lakes surf rescue project yeah and then i thought well okay the next thing is to push on and does I believe in this second life surfing? It's not just some stupid animation thing. It's a real thing. People actually live their lives in second life. So what I did is I made the Great Lakes Surfing Association a sponsor of the Second Life Surfing Association contest. Oh, cool! So we got a, a big banner and advertising says GLSA on it at their con every one of their contests on the on, on the podium where they award the trophies and stuff, and it flashes on and off along with other ads. 
And then um, we some of the prize money for them and I plastered that around Second Life. I kept it alive in Second Life. And I says, and I made the invitation. Anybody want to come into Second Life? Um, Bob Pratt came in. One Only one person ever came in from uh, physical life in the Second Life to, to surf. Um, and I extended the invitation. So like the Great Lake Surfing Association is still on the forefront of pioneer surfing. And, and uh, we're surfing yeah. in a virtual world where before uh, the pioneer thing was surfing on the Great Lakes, which as far as regular people are concerned, is a virtual world, doesn't it? Just yeah. uh, you can't do it. You can't surf on the Great Lakes thing. Mm -hmm. It's a virtual unreality. <laughs> yeah, but really. I say no. I say <laughs> you are surfing whenever you think you are surfing and you are surfing. I, I, uh, I, I certainly believe that. I, I, I don't think a lot of things, um, there's no such thing as color. Things don't have color. Your eyes perceive different things to have yeah. color, but they don't actually have a color. You know, you are what you perceive and you are doing what you perceive, whether it be just a dream or an imagination. Yeah. If you think you're really doing it, you're doing it. So Bob, I, I am not the best surfer in the world but I love it. Yeah. And, but I'll tell you doing this podcast and, you know, just being on the computer every day, uh, you know, working on different projects, surf related. I, f I mean, the time I've spent in the water is way less compared to any of that, but I feel like I'm surfing every day in a sense, just because of that heavy involvement, being around it, talking to surfers every day. You uh, really are Derek. You are. Yeah. Because Real surfers don't surf that much, to believe it or not. The okay. only few fleeting seconds they spend on our wave, actually riding a wave to, compared to the hours of driving a car, um, yeah. all your other life things and stuff, and talking with other surfers and doing other stuff. Your actually time actually riding waves is is really short it's compared minimal, to how much yeah. time you spend in the in the culture itself. And yeah, that's what I'm finding out. I was I was really at a time before I started surfing in Second Life, I really missed the surf culture, and yeah. I missed it more actually from not being in Mexico than I did from being in Grand Haven because Grand Haven, I mean, Great Lakes don't have waves that often, mm -hmm. you know, months without waves. Yeah. And you're not seeing everybody every other day like you do in the ocean. When you're surfing yeah. in Mexico, you're seeing the same Mexican dudes, American dudes, California dudes out in the water. Every other day you're seeing them out there because you're surfing a couple of times a week. Yeah. But in Great Lakes, no, there's no real built up surf culture because there just isn't that much surf. I mean, you just yeah. can't go surfing every single day and hang out by the where other surfers are hanging out because there's no surfers hanging out there because there's no surf, you know. And yeah. so that's what I really liked about Second Life is all of a sudden I would go to the beat, hey, Doc, yeah, wow, nice ride, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And you're, you're seeing all this, you're doing all this stuff, I don't know, maybe. I'll take it for what it's worth. I, I might have to check it out and, and uh, meet you in the lineup out there. Yeah, I've done some podcasts actually <laughs> in Second Life. People do uh, their podcasts right in Second Life. Oh, where wow. You have your own talk show. Like right now, I'm just sitting here watching you sitting in, uh, uh, looks like your bedroom. Um, but Second Life, you can just have your own studio with a show and like Johnny Carson or something. You know I mean? oh, cool. You know, you, you can set up your own thing and and talk just the way you are now. We talk in Second Life and yeah. microphones and um, your plug. I got your plugs on now. I just bought these for this. So Normally, Bob, I just. What does it mean? Like, what is the uh, what does it take to be a member of the GLSA? What is the responsibilities? Of its members, nothing. Um, okay, <laughs> really, you just got to say you are a member of GLSA. I, I tell you the truth, Dave Wagemaker and I were uh, anti GLSA. We were the great, we were the South Bay surfers. We were the locals. They were coming up from Grand Rapids. The GLSA was not from Grand Haven. They were from Grand Rapids. There are a few okay. of the members, Rick Craig Van Singel and that were from Grand Haven. They lived right across the street from the beach, but he was a local too. We were locals and these Grand Haven kids were coming up here forming this Great Lake Surfing Association, but they were city dwellers. They're from the valley. Like in California, they were the valley surfers that come up to the beach. We were the coastal surfers. We were we lived on the beach, you know. So when they came, we never joined them. We used to kind of make fun of them and stuff. We never joined when we went to the contest. We never paid any. Uh, we always paid the contest fees, but we never paid. Uh, we never joined the. We never joined the GLSA mm -hmm. because um, 
we were their rivals. And then when we came up with those shorter, what they shot were shorter boards because they were under nine feet. And they thought, wow, you know, because we were, Dave Wagemaker and I were, I was a nonconformist in high school. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't part of the hippie movement, but the hippies were kind of nonconformist, but they were a conformist in a way because they all conformed like other hippies were. But yeah. I was a nonconformist, like, I don't want to be like that whole group is over there, which is uh, usually yeah. the jocks. Um, our guys were all had varsity letters and they were on the football team or whatever. And they were all the party guys. They were all the guys who had the parties. I never wanted to be in a clique. I never wanted to be that. I could always see them from a distance. I never wanted to be part of that. I always wanted to be a somebody different. Um, and do my own thing, kind of. Yeah. And that's the way I was with the GLSA. I never wanted to say, oh, okay, those all surfers are all going to band together and make their own little club and have their newsletters and meetings and contests and all that kind of stuff. But hey, I'm going surfing. And gotcha. if one of the guys drops in on me, that's just too bad. <laughs> Run them over. You know? Well, hey, it would be it would be a lifelong dream come true to be part of the GLSA. So what do I got to do? Oh, nothing. You're, uh, oh. You, I mean, if you were all these Great Lakes surfers, you're contributing to history. And that's one thing that uh, GLSA is now too, is, is, is accumulating the history of surfing. That's how I did the right. surf project in the museum. So permastoke should be part of the right. chronology. You yeah. should put a little thing on the bottom, uh, Sponsored by, you know, uh, you could put the little GLSA thing on the bottom of your page. I okay. mean, you have my, you have my um, permission to do that. I'm the director, and you can put a little GLSA thing on your on your page if you want Thank to. Thank you, Bob. I love it. And you're an honorary member, uh, just because of all the work you do. Uh, you care about other surfers. You're interviewing them. You're preserving what they have to say for future generations. Uh, no, you you are an honor. It's an honor to welcome you into the GLSA. I never thought of it that way. Thank you, you so much. You don't have to sign Bob. a card. You don't have to pay any dues. Although you can if you want to. <laughs> Do we get it? No. Is there a newsletter that exists? No. no, there's no. I don't collect any money. Oh, okay. I spend more money on the GLSA than I. Gotcha. No, is there a newsletter that comes out anymore? Though? There used to be. Um, uh, Rick Boss and I used to put out the. It's before I was a director, but we used to put out, and I got a lot of the magazines. If you'd like a copy of each one, I'll send them to you. I would love it. Yeah. And um, they're the original magazines. And I've got some, some of them, I got dozens and dozens of the same ones. So anybody's listening and wants some. Yeah. Um, and let me know if you ever need a hand with any of that or want to resurrect anything. I kind of want to do a lot of stuff. Yeah. I'd yeah. like to get my website so I could access it again. I built that with front page. And the front page is kaput, so I can't edit my own website. Oh, I want to get that so I can edit that again and add to it. And I want to um, do my memoirs. I do want to do an official account of the rescue. Uh, I gave a pretty good account there. There's been a lot of false stories that build up around it. Um, about people have tried to get, become involved in it that had nothing to do with it. Um, it just in weird ways that people are telling that story of that rescue. So it did have to be told. I think I told it, I, I told it truthfully, but I don't know if it was concise that I included everything I needed to put in there. Uh, okay. I think I did though. I think I did. I, it pretty much, it was a scary ordeal. I'm very proud I did it. It was a turning point in my life. From there, I went into beach and pure safety activity. Uh, after that, it changed the way I thought about the lakes and about people in the lakes and things like that. And um, all my surfing up to that point, I could have never done it without all the training of surfing that I had, the skills that I had, the attitude that I had up till November 10th. And then after that, uh, um, <laughs> the loss of confidence, <laughs> the feeling like the helplessness and stuff like that that came afterwards. I, I just, all of a sudden, I just didn't take the chances I used to take surfing. Um, I didn't drop in on the biggest and the latest waves as I could. I just didn't do it. Didn't have that gung ho thing anymore. I yeah. was kind of shattered by that whole experience, although it was successful. And as far as what I did, um, and I don't take full credit for it. To Whitey, I says Whitey and Burl each saved, helped save that one guy, and we each lost one guy. Um, it wasn't one person saved one person. It was like we all saved one person and we all lost one person. So um, that's that. Um, that, that did change my life. That one hour and a half out in Lake Michigan on that night. Yeah. It changed the way I think and the way I acted. I just lost my ear pod. Um, there you go. Um, yeah, that's 
that was that. I guess if, if you have anything at the end of your life, you like to say, well, what did I do in my life? I mean, what? I mean, okay, I tracked up a bunch of waves that would have gone to shore and broken anyway. Um, <laughs> what did I do? Okay, I saved that kid's life. Okay, that helped. Yeah. I probably tried to make the piers safer and the beaches safer. I spread the good word about that kind of stuff. Um, there's still some more stuff to do um, as far as actually having some real rescue techniques for getting people out of the rock pile once they get drowning out there so Matt doesn't have to drag them in. Um, there's ways to do that. And then like I talked to you about the, the rip current, if you know when it's coming, when it's coming, where it's coming, hey, send your kid out there with their raft and a tether and let them ride the rip current, you know. It'll be that safe. I mean, if you knew exactly where it was and when it was and how it worked, you could go out and play in the damn thing, mm -hmm. not drown in it. Yeah. So I'm thinking that day's going to come. I might not see it, but it's, I know it's within our technological grasp with them buoys out there to pick them up on the open lake when they're coming our way. And then uh, inshore ones that can measure it too. Um, yeah. There's, and you we know, need to get your name on that app or maybe like the icon for it or something could be your famous glasses with the strap or something. Yeah. <laughs> I don't wear that anymore, Derek. Oh, you I, don't? No, I had, I had piss poor vision. That's come. I, I got drafted for Vietnam War, but I failed the physical examination down in Detroit because I uh, could, I missed within 10 feet of one of my eyes being able to see good enough so that I wouldn't be shooting generals instead of. Oh. And so I had to wear glasses all my time surfing. And, but then I got an eye operation or a LASIK thing where they put the lens inside your eyeball. They slip yeah. your eyeball open and they slide a little lens in there. And, and uh, I can, I don't have my glasses on now. I'm seeing perfectly. Really? I'll put them tonight when I drive back out to the farm, I'll put them on and, just because I can see a little bit better at night. I can see things a little bit better, but no, I don't need glasses anymore. So if I ever did go out surfing again, I wouldn't have to wear glasses. Oh, wow. Yeah. I can't even imagine. I, I can't. I don't think the surfers would the... freak out if, yeah, they would yeah. freak out if they saw me out there nowadays. <laughs> um, I'm sure they would freak out if they saw me out there. I would freak out if I saw me out there now. Wow. Uh, but yeah, I don't wear glasses anymore. That's strange. Yeah. I've worn glasses since the fourth grade. Wow, yeah, that's a long time. Google goggles. Call me goggles or four eyes, whatever. <laughs> so, Bob, I think, you know, the your goggles, the rescues, I think you're being a little modest too. I think you're going to be, <laughs> you're going to leave behind quite a legacy. It has been an honor, man, talking to you. And uh, I also want to say this. I want to read off the quote that you say in um, Step in the Liquid. You say, waves are where you find them, you know? There's a lot of argument about where's best. And you know, this doesn't match up with California. It's not Malibu. Well, don't put me in a national contest or anything like that. But I have as much fun as anyone else and I like it as much. And so, I mean, that to me captures the spirit and essence of Great Lakes surfing. There's another part of that interview. I sent a picture of me being interviewed. I think it's in one of those pictures. And one thing they asked me is they said, okay, that they ask all these other surfers there. That wasn't the only one they interviewed, but they ask everybody, what do you do in the wintertime? Oh, I got nine mil booties. I got 20 mil this and that, blah, 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 super vests and this and that. And they say, doc, what do you do in the wintertime surfing? I say, I go to Mexico. <laughs> and Dana and the camera guy both laughed and I think the camera guy was laughing so hard he couldn't hold the camera steady so I oh, think they okay. cut that out although that's it's on the cutting room floor and I had them both laughing because I just and just the way I said this is I go to Mexico I mean yeah yeah okay you got 15 mil booties or whatever what the hell <laughs> okay great you know but I go to Mexico you know and uh they had to start to laugh. They were laughing and laughing. Yeah. Those, guys, those guys were fun because not only did they film us, they party with us. We just all up there sucking down beers together and having a great time. Um, yeah. And then we'd all head out to the surf. But they just that one day that all the surfers took off to the south end because it's oh, there could be great surf down at the south end. So they all took off out of Sheboygan early, and I, I had to check out the hotel late. And I thought, well, I'll go down and look at the waves one last time. I just seen the film crew sit, standing out at the end of the little jetty there. They're trying to film somebody. I think Andy on the North Shore. I thought, hey, they're never going to use that footage. They're too far away. 
to get any good shots of him. I can just go down and surf right in front of him. So I just popped on down the hill with my board, popped into the water, paddled out right in front of the camera, mm-hmm. took off on a little wave and cut towards the pier. And I made, I made probably the biggest surfing scene in the movie. For, I mean, for the Great Lakes. Yeah. I mean, as far as somebody actually riding a wave, uh, the rest of it's just a bunch of... Yeah, don't you do a nice right where you go? Yeah, you know? well, it's a left. I'm going left oh, and then left. I'm like okay. moving around right. And when they first came out with a with a, a trailer for that film, they played Yellow. Um, I saw Coldplay? Yellow by uh, Coldplay. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, well, and that was just fad. I wish I would have recorded that first trailer uh, because they kept changing. That movie, okay. they keep changing. The movie's uh, changed too. That's the, the thing. The music with these digital they put films. To that part was pretty good too. Yeah, with the digital films nowadays, they can keep changing the versions of the movie. Um, oh, I don't I think see. it's the same movie as it was when it first came out as it is now. Oh, really? It'd be different. Yeah. I have the original on blue or DVD, probably, so I haven't seen any. Well, if they got the Coldplay song on there, I'd oh, like cool. to see that because um, that's the one I remember it by. And I thought, wow, I finally made it to the big <laughs> this end of summer thing, you know, the movies. Yeah. And I was just thrilled about that. Were you kind of starstruck around Dana? Yeah, it it, was really cool because at one point in my surfing career, and it came on late after many years had rolled by and I'm getting late in my career. And I was go down to places like South Haven and I'd get on my van and have guys run up to me. And I used to sign autographs and all that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. And I, the God, I felt like, oh shit, now I got to go out and surf. I mean, what, you know, they're going to expect me to. Yeah. Well, it's really fancy surfing and stuff. <laughs> and at that point in my life, I mean, I was pretty good surfer, but not, not where I was going to really wow somebody. Yeah. You know? And um, no, all eyes. Were yeah, yeah. But it was golden. Those are golden times. That that in the seventies down in Mexico uh, were my golden years. Those are, mm. that's worth a whole podcast right there is Mexico because, oh my God, that was fantastic. Um. All right. Yeah, next we, time we we're save it for you. Run out of people to film and stuff. Then you come back, we'll dock it up. And, uh, you know, instead of being 74, maybe I'll be 84. But you come oh, back. I'll and, be back before uh, I run out of guests just because I like talking to you. But I can't imagine what I'm going to be like if I ever make it to 90. If I ask oh, God, you to be on here at 90. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you get that old, you're kind of like a walking skeleton. My mom lived to be 94. My aunt oh, okay. lived to be 96. And I'm telling you, once you be up in that age, you're just like a walking skeleton. I mean, basically, uh, yeah. you just, I can't say people live too long, but there's a point where you think, wow, uh, that's that's something. I mean, you know, how, how, are, they li- how are they alive, you know? Yeah. Uh, because they don't look like it, you know what I mean? Um, they don't look like they should be alive, but they still are. Gotcha. The brain, so, the brain. Yeah, yeah, it's scary. Old age, life itself, if you think about it, uh, if you're only 38 years old, you don't think about it too much. But if you get to be 68, you get into your 70s, then all of a sudden I'm taking a whole new look on this whole thing. I'm thinking, wow. I mean, I've been trying to save money for when I get old, you know, so I have enough. Well, yeah. I am old, you know. <laughs> I still don't have and, enough. And, I, and I'm thinking I better start spending some money yeah. rather than saving money because otherwise I'm not <laughs> What's there's no reason for, yeah. yeah i'm thinking i mean i'm looking you look at the obituaries a lot and you're seeing wow that guy died 66 that guy's 67 that guy's 72 that lady is 74 she's as old as i am you know so wow. you start realizing hey this could be it this could tomorrow could be the day and then wow i still haven't done this i still haven't done that Jeez. uh i gotta break my memoirs i gotta do something on this i there's a bunch of stuff i gotta do and there's all this surf rescue stuff. I got, I got to pass that on to oh, the guy down at the public safety department that does the rescues there. And so they got a way of rescuing people off that pier that they're not going to get any officers killed. I mean, we've had to rescue police officers. That's a man. Bob Push, I had to rescue a police officer one time who was making huh. rescues wearing a Neptune Jeez. suit. They got these guys putting on Neptune suits, jumping off into four or five foot waves in Neptune suits. I wow. think that's insane. The guy asked me, he says, what do you think about these Neptune suits? He says, I'd never jump in the water with that. I don't know anybody who would. Any surfer that would jump in the water wearing a Neptune suit. I said, boy, that you get so much flotation. The wave is just going to pick you up and throw you against a pier. You can't duck dive the waves. You can't pop under the wave. It, it, you just could get hit by everything that's going to hit you. And you can't move around. Yeah, yeah. I says, it's ridiculous. I mean, the water is 70 degrees and they're putting on these suits to keep mm. warm if it's 25 degrees. Yeah. 
it's just silly. It's just all manual stuff they've seen in a manual. And it's not like anything they practically would ever use out there. Get yourself yeah. killed. And yeah, Bob had to rescue a guy in a Neptune suit one time. He, and then right, rescue, but he had to help muddle the water. The guy was all fucked up. I mean, he's bad. <laughs> walking around, he's staggering around, dazed. His head was all banged up. And he tried to yeah. get off the side of the pier and go rescue this girl. He surfer brought the girl in. And uh, this guy got slammed into the pier and then had to kind of wade in through shore, through the rocks. And Bob yeah. had to jump down there and help him in because he, he didn't know what he was doing. I mean, he was messed up. Man. I mean, and just stuff like that, you yeah. see stuff that happened. The night of the rescues, there's a surfer there. They tied, I mean, there's one, there's some, there was some uh, Keystone Cop things going on during that rescue thing too. I mean, some hilarity, some comedy going on. Believe it or not, despite how tragic the whole thing was and serious, but um, there's one surfer there that uh, Mrs. Eastling, Burl's mom, who's Burl is out there in the rescue, says, how can you stand there in your wetsuit? My son's out there. Uh, he might be drowning right now, and you can save him, and you're just standing there hiding behind the rescue truck. And the guy was just kind of hiding behind the rescue truck. He didn't want to go out there. I don't blame him. I don't know if I would have gone out there if I hadn't seen Whitey go. I mean, I just followed Whitey. Whitey told me we've got to go save him, Doc. And so I said, okay, Whitey. And I'm very persuasive. And I, I mean, you can say, in fact, we got to go jump into hell hole or something like that. And I probably yeah. do it because you told me to. Um, <laughs> but this guy didn't want to go out. And she actually shamed him to go out there. So he ran out the pier. And there's some cops out there trying to go through the motions that they were doing something. They weren't doing anything. There's an upper landing to that pier. And there's a lower landing. And you say in the upper landing, you're not going to get washed off. They were up there. And so he came out and they tied a rope around his ankle. And that's, that's you know, 15 feet off the water when you're standing up there. So he dives in the water with his rope tied around his ankle. And it was only like a 50 foot line. I don't know what he's going to do with it. But the fact that it took the slack up in the line, it lifted his foot up and put his head underwater. He said he almost drowned and he barely got around it, untying the rope. And then he surfed into shore and he just vanished. He was not to be seen around there anymore, but yeah. that was like Keystone Cop kind of stuff that just silliness going on out there. But um, so, you know, the famous saying, Bob, um, so your friend jumps in the lake. What are you going to jump in the lake too? I guess in your case. I did. Said, I mean, yes. Derek, had, Whitey <laughs> said to me, Doc, we got to go save those guys. I said, yeah, right. I, mean, I thought, what in the hell am I doing out here in the first place? I mean, yeah. barely, I can barely handle this. I mean, I was, Derek. I was riding the biggest waves I ever rode there. And I did drop in on some beauties, you know, they're way overhead. Wow. And um, like that. Uh, Have you seen waves like that since? No. No, eh? wow. Not, no, I never seen Once waves bigger than I saw that morning around 10 o'clock. Those wow. are the biggest waves I've seen almost anywhere. And I've been, I was out in Hurricane Incredible. Camille in the, North Carolina, and there, there were some big waves coming in off of that. They might have yeah. been bigger, but mm. no, these are the biggest I've ever seen in the lake or anybody has seen in the lake. Yeah. And I've seen some of the big storms. The one of 98 was a big one. And I saw that. And they weren't, these were bigger than those waves. It's been, Awesome talking to you. And uh, yeah, I can't wait. We'll just pick it up again some other time. But thank you for coming on and sharing these great stories with me. And uh, yeah, it's been great getting to know you a bit. And welcome to the Great Lake Surfing Association. And you got it right from the director himself invited you personally. Thank you so much. I am honored. I'll try to find all those membership cards and Start printing them out again. <laughs> now that would be. Uh, let me super let me look through cool. that stuff. I'm moving right yeah. now, so I I might find all that. Could dig okay. into all that stuff. It's sitting here in a box. In our I would love that and cherish it. I probably okay. Frame. All right, I'll do that. I'll do that yeah. uh, tomorrow when I can see something in here. Excellent. I'll send again. you my. Uh, I'll send you my address um, for those magazines and. Uh, oh, the magazines I... and the membership card. Yeah. And um, whatever else I can send you, I'll send awesome. it to you. And once I get some new merch in, I'm, I'm going to send you a shirt and some stuff too. Oh, so. cool. Otherwise, once that border opens up one day, I can't wait to make my way to Grand Haven for the first time yeah. and meet all you fellas. You're quite a ways away over in Ontario. Yeah. Um, yeah oh, but speaking of that, I have to tell you one more. It's not a question. It's a statement. Our very own... Larry Cavero, the Stoke master himself from Toronto, says, Bob, come over and surf Toronto once the border reopens. 
<laughs> All right. So All right. there you go. You're in demand. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, Will do. I've got to get back in shape again, Derek. I, uh, I'm in bad shape right now physically. Uh, okay. Trouble breathing. Um, uh, it's just going to take some time for me to get back in the surf again. I do want to get back in the physical surf again. Oh, oh and actually ride a wave. Um, yeah. I do want to do that again. Um, but it's going to take some time. And then, of course, and then once I can surf again, then I will come over there across the bridge. And um, the last time I went across that bridge, they stopped me. They, uh, they wouldn't, they weren't going to let me into Canada because I had too much junk in the back of my van. Okay, yeah, maybe <laughs> we don't want stuff this stuff. In, we don't want all this junk in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> said, Wait a minute. I'm just cutting through. I'm, it was quicker for me to cut through Canada to get to New York City because mm. I was going there to look for, I wanted to become and get a job in a war gaming company. And um, okay. to get there, I had to take my Volkswagen van across the bridge to Canada for the Port Huron, I think. Yep. And when I got across there, they said, you can't come into our country with all this stuff. I, I, mean, I have my library, my books, <laughs> all my books of Napoleon and stuff. My yeah. soldiers I painted and all this kind of stuff. And um, uh, But I finally talked him into it and he let me. And then I think I was coming in the Niagara or whatever on the Canadian side. And yeah. I saw these parts of my van rolling down the street ahead of my van. <laughs> it was like my generator and a bunch of uh, stuff yeah. that was pieces there. So I spent a lot of my time in your Volkswagen place. Yeah. And I finally made it out there, finally made it to New York. Awesome. But yeah, that was the last time I went to Canada. But I'll I go up there again. I've been there a few times. Great. All right. We will see you up in the Great White North. The Great White North. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, Bob. And for anyone out there listening to this, if you haven't seen Step in the Liquid, do yourself oh. a favor and watch that film already. Or right, come on over to Grand Haven. I'll tell you the real story. <laughs> there you go. I get the tale firsthand or tune in for part two, three, four of this event. Yeah. So. A regular feature on the podcast. Yeah. All right. All right, Bob. Well, you have a great evening, my friend, and stay stoked. Shaka, Shaka. <laughs>